I want to ask all of us to please turn off our cell phones to silent. You may notice board members accessing their laptops, phones, and other devices during the meeting. They are using their devices to access board materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California. As such, disruptions of the board's business will not be tolerated. We have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and ask for public comment on each agenda item. I ask that you be respectful of the need to conduct the board's business. <clears throat> Should anyone disrupt the meeting, I will ask that person to conduct him or herself in such a manner that permits the board to transact its business. This meeting will be available via teleconference. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, press star one, you will hear a tone indicating you are in queue for comment. If you change your mind and do not want to make a comment, press star two. Assistance is available throughout the teleconferencing meeting. To request a specialist, press star zero. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. However, that time frame may be subject to change depending upon the number of speakers on the topic. During agenda item two, public comments on agenda items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals on the teleconference to 20 minutes. In addition, the total public comments for individuals here at the meeting today will be limited to 20 minutes. Therefore, after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 10 minutes will be allowed for the total comment period from individuals on the teleconference line and 10 minutes from those in the audience. After 10 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Each person will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. Business Services Office staff will be assisting me with receiving the public comments via teleconference during this meeting. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand or come forward and you'll be recognized. I would like to request all speaker slips speakers to uh, complete a presenter slip so that I can call you by name at the appropriate time and that the record of this meeting can be full and complete. However, this is voluntary. Please give the speaker slips to Ms. Cruz Jones. Ms. Cruz Jones, can you raise your hand? There she is. Um, I, would, I will do my best to call upon everyone who has supplied a slip for the agenda item and recognize those who wish to make a last minute comment. I want to remind all speakers to stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less. Today's meeting <clears throat> will be run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law. We plan to end today around 5.30. We're not introducing anyone. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Cruz Jones please call the roll. Dr. Bolat? Present. Dr. Ganadev? Here. Dr. Hawkins? Here. Dr. Krause? Here. Ms. Lawson? Dr. Levine? Here. Dr. Lewis? Present. Ms. Sutton Wills? Mr. Warmoth? Here. Ms. Wright? Here. Dr. Yip? Here. Ms. Pines? Here. We have a quorum. Um, I would like to remind the members again that we will take roll call vote 
on action items. Moving to agenda item two, public comment on items not on the agenda. Before we invite speakers to come forward, I would ask individuals making comments to not discuss pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the members that is outside the record and in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and lead to a board decision being challenged in superior court. The board can receive comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where the decision is still pending. Board staff is available to speak with you about any pending matter. In addition, the board would like to the public to address the board as a whole and not to individual members. Please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to comments and decide whether they want a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on this item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like the board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. I have the following slips and I'll call upon Elizabeth Becker. Ah, there you go. Okay. Can you, um, hold thank on. You. Can you start her time again, please? Oh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the board today. I, I do have some information. I will leave it here, and you can let me know whether or not it's appropriate to distribute. It's intended specifically for the committee members, um, like Dr. Hawkins, and committee members of the um, members of the Wellness and Phys uh, Education Committee. Um, I want to just take a moment to introduce myself so you know a little bit about who I am and what my background is and why I'm here. Um, uh, I am the original developer of the Professional Boundaries Program that used to be with PACE. And I was the Director of Behavioral Programs at the UCSD PACE Program for a number of years. And um, I, uh, in 2005, I believe it was, I worked with um, District Attorney Sandy Feldman, at which time we developed the current criteria for the Professional Boundary Program. We made it so it was three days live, it had X amount of CME, we talked about the criteria, what would be important to see in that um, kind of remediation course. And now, to, the, to this day, those are still the standards by which the board, be, um, med the medical board uses to determine whether or not um, it's appropriate for physician remediation when someone has a stipulated agreement that has met the criteria for some sort of boundary violation as a result of some unprofessional conduct. I then went on to um, create for UCSD what's now referred to as the Anger Management Program. Um, it's really about stress coping and communication and it was designed specifically for physicians who engaged in what we now refer to as unprofessional conduct. I have since left PACE, and I continue to do that work independently, but I think it, my experience at PACE taught me that um, um, a lot of what would prevent some of these events from occurring in the life of a physician had been preventive measures, opportunities to learn some of the things that they were not being taught in medical school. And after spending years and years and years sitting across from physicians, um, 
repeatedly, and I'm talking about hundreds and hundreds of physicians who would say to me, it would have been so nice and lovely to have gotten some of this information in advance of a complaint being filed. And so what I chose to do is I chose to continue the work that I do, but more from a prevention model. But as time and years have gone by, um, what I've become more and more concerned with is that uh, physicians who are issued a public letter of reprimand, to my knowledge, are not being given the opportunity to engage in any kind of professional growth and development or self-corrective measures to try to figure out what it is that they might be doing that's creating risk for them down the road. And Please I know, conclude. I'm sorry. I know that this stuff gets tracked and trended. And so I guess my request here today is that the board consider, um, especially those who are on the committee, committee members for uh, physician wellness and physician education, is consider issuing along with a public letter of reprimand um, a list of resources where physicians could go to maybe get the support and the help that they need um, more from a prevention model as opposed to waiting until they've stumbled and fallen off the cliff, you know, and are now in remediation phase. Um, Your time's up. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So thank I have you. some additional information here if anybody is interested. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mary Ann Hollingsworth. Good afternoon, my name is Marian Hollingsworth and I'm a patient safety advocate with the Patient Safety League and the Patient Safety Action Network. Since this meeting is in San Diego, there are concerns that the board is not adequately protecting local consumers. There have been a number of cases lately where you have consistently sided with doctors over the safety of San Diegans. One of the most egregious cases was Dr. Jeffrey Abrams. He was allowed to remain in practice for three months even though the investigation knew he had 1,300 illicit pictures of women and even a child on his phone. That decision put more people at risk. One victim finally got tired of waiting and went to a local reporter who finally broke the story. Only then was Abrams arrested and later suspended. Another in case involved El Cajon pain specialist Naga Thoda. The board put him on seven years probation in 2016 for overprescribing opioids. Just a few months later, however, the DEA raided Thoda's office and arrested him in a sex for drug scheme with patients. It seems the investigator missed that. Egisto Salerno was able to get his license reinstated after he lost it for a personal addiction in 2001. You then terminated his probation early. However, just last spring, he was again in trouble with an accusation for overprescribing. But while you were pondering his discipline, the DEA swooped in and arrested him for running a pill mill along El Cajon Boulevard. These cases make us wonder if the DEA and the board ever communicate with each other. And just last week, you made a deal with Dr. William Buckner, allowing him to serve two probations concurrently. Buckner was given five years probation in 2016 for three alcohol-related arrests, including a DUI. This year, he got three more years probation for gross negligence. However, instead of adding them up, you apparently thought it was appropriate for him to serve both disciplines at the same time. How does this protect patients? Tomorrow, I'll be talking about a childbirth, a childbirth death case in uh, Southern California that was quite egregious. These are just a few examples of how the board fails local consumers. How can the medical board claim it put patient safety first when it gives preference to doctors in each of these decisions? We expect you to follow disciplinary guidelines, but this obviously never, obviously rarely happens. Consumers deserve better than this from the medical board. We deserve an agency that will truly put patients first. Thank you. Thank you. Eric Andrews. So this is my first meeting as an official representative of the Patient Safety League, our new nonprofit organization. Our website is located at forpatientsafety.org. 
Our first main project is going to be the, to officially monitor everything about the medical board and every discipline that comes out of it. We will be tracking stories from consumers who have been mistreated by this agency and report those cases to the legislature and the media. We've started raising money so that we can always have at least one of our reps at every medical board meeting. I know you're all really excited about that. Our doctor database is in full swing and we've currently logged 670 of your license alerts from March of 2015 to the present for a total of 1,951 doctors and continue to add more every day. Out of that amount, 264 doctors have sexual misconduct charges and 155 of those are currently practicing medicine. 10 right here in San Diego and 49 in the Los Angeles area. There are two doctors, a dentist and a podiatrist that we found in our research that are currently on the sex offender registry and are still practicing medicine. And guess what? Breeze does not let consumers know that they're registered sex offenders, at least not without having to wade through hard to find documents full of legalese. 22 of those doctors have no disciplinary information on Breeze at all. So a consumer looking them up on your website would find nothing about sexual misconduct, but they will find it on our website. We've had over 10,000 visitors to our website in the last six months, 9% more than the previous six months. Our doctor search page was accessed 4,329 times in the last 90 days. We are also chronicling doctors that are in the news for egregious misconduct that you will take far too long to warn consumers about if you do at all. We felt forced into starting this nonprofit organization when the medical board chose to do wrong by our consumer complaints and to protect bad doctors over victims that were harmed or killed. When we've tried to get answers, we were met either with being ignored, erroneous answers, or illegally be hiding behind non-mandatory exemptions in the law and trying to charge people for what should be simple computer searches. Even though the law doesn't allow for it, these actions clearly favor and protect doctors, not consumers, and that's what we're gathering the evidence to prove. We already have more than 30 public record requests that have been illegally handled, and they are in a database that we're constantly adding to as you continue to hide your actions instead of being a transparent governmental agency. Consumer complaints against doctors keep going up, but oddly the number of disciplinary actions stay steady at a measly 4%. Several of you have accusations or lawsuits against you for conflicts of interest, but you show up here time after time very smugly pretending that you're doing this state a favor by just being here. I beg to differ, and the Patient Safety League is here for good to make sure everyone knows exactly what's really going on with this agency. It would be wise to stop ignoring us and start working with us to truly keep the consumers of this state safe from doctors who misbehave, harm, and kill. And remember, I'm only here all every time because you guys didn't investigate my sister's death. She died, the doctor got away with it because you guys closed my case twice without investigating. This is my Please sister, conclude. she's dead. Thank you. Thank you. Yvonne Slater Griggs. I'm going to be reading this for efficacy and for time. My name is Yvonne Slater Grigas. I am here as a concerned citizen. My requests reflect hundreds of thousands of parents statewide, and I'm in many different organizations, lo uh, locally and statewide. Thank you to the board for allowing me to make a comment today. With what has happened in California since the law SB 277 has passed and now the discussion of health department and or legislation to limit a licensed medical doctor to use their medical discretion to assess, diagnose, and write medical exemptions, I implore the board to put on the future agenda how the California Medical Board will hold doctors and medical institutions accountable for not reporting adverse events to vaccination based on the federal mandate through the law 1986 National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. The only way to fully comprehend the extent of injury and fully understand the dynamics within a population at risk for injury is if the aftermarket surveillance system is used. At this time, the surveillance system is not being used as evidenced that doctors and nurses do not know about it. This they have no knowledge of the NBIA, NCBIA, National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act, nor do they realize they are federally mandated to report adverse events as outlined in the law, just like HIPAA violations. 
So I ask that you address this concern at your next agenda, and I ask for a written response. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't have any more slips for anyone in the audience, so we're going to go to the phones. Are there any comments on the phone? We do have a comment on the phone. Susan Lauren, Sir Shibley, all the tasted for line is open. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, thanks. I'm concerned for the citizens of the home. I have reason to be. I was surgically assaulted. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I'm sorry. It's, I'm not hearing you on my phone. Is it okay if I just start? I'll talk quickly. I'm concerned for the citizens of California. I have reason to be. I was surgically assaulted, disabled, and disfigured by a board-certified plastic surgeon. I've been highly recommended to by my PCP for medically indicated breast reduction. The surgeon runs a privately owned ambulatory center with no effective oversight. I came to convulsing, stuffed into a compression garment I couldn't breathe in. I was all cut up in ways I was never told about. I was in mind-blowing pain and knew something was terribly wrong. I told the surgeon who immediately went into deny and defend mode. The Medical Board of California has thus far let this dangerous surgeon continue to practice. He has harmed other women since I reported the assault to you. The surgeon slandered me to discredit me, which set me up for more medical harm. Many procedures that board-certified plastic surgeons do make healthy people worse off. The doctors and their boards mislead the public, do many innately bad procedures with carte blanche, lie for each other, and cover up their crimes. I was told breast repositioning would remedy my pain and stop me from getting keratomas from my workout bras. The surgeon convinced me to add on a touch of lipo to smooth the contour. He said it wasn't for weight loss, there's no scars or downtime, and he was a surgical expert. I had no idea he'd remove my buttocks and other needed parts and destroy me with PALS, a power-assisted tool I didn't know about or consent to. Women who go for breast reduction ought not to get coerced into liposuction, which is dangerous and causes long-term increase in visceral fat, which is linked to cardiovascular disease <laughs> and other diseases and causes adipose tissue to redistribute in odd, unhealthy ways. The negligent, unskilled surgeon slandered me, charged me for his assault and for a corrupt trial. A reality show plastic surgeon that reviews cases for your board committed perjury at my trial, as did the surgeon who mutilated me. My current doctor wrote your board in an effort to protect the public. He emphatically states that the surgeon committed surgical assault on me, caused severe bodily damage, and perjured himself under sworn testimony. He reminded you that other doctors and experts demonstrated and testified that areas were damaged where consent had not been obtained. There are no mitigating circumstances to this assault. Senator Jerry Hill said, the Medical Board of California has a statutory required mission to prioritize public safety above any other value or goal, and that failure by the California Medical Board to meet this goal in each case is egregious and legally, ethically, and morally unacceptable. You could have print prevented harm to others. Why are you giving this dangerous surgeon carte blanche? Reopen the case and protect the public. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the phone? Yes. The next person is Kenwar Gill, private citizen. Your line is open. Uh, hi, my name is Kenwar Gill. I'm calling from Fresno, California, and the audio quality is, uh, you know, at the very least useless because as good as the video podcast is, the audio is uh, essentially not audible at our end. Uh, the comments I have to make is that almost all of the speakers who preceded me in the public comment section um, has a grievance against the um, individually licensed providers while uh, you know all 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 the people doesn't seem to understand that there are entities beyond just individually licensed MDs, RNs and LVNs that indulge in what I would call uh, aiding and abetting of uh, unlicensed practice of medicine and the leader in this is California Department of Public Health, uh, licensing clinics through health and safety code, and subsequently not showing up for the operational site visits or inspections to see compliance with the law. What I've noticed in past 10 or 11 years is that these clinics have 
unlicensed people making decisions on overall care of the patients from referrals to uh, follow-up appointments to how the patient care would be coordinated. And in these circumstances, I feel like there is a need for medical board to kind of collaborate or jointly work on the complaints of unlicensed practice of medicine arising out of these clinics and not just forwarded them to the CDPH who has not done any good work maybe because of the budgetary cuts or staffing shortage but people of California should not bear the risk of laziness on part of the department. Secondly what I've noticed in last few years is uh, an increased indulgence of uh, unlicensed professionals to start non-profits and subsequently get it licensed under the CDPH health and safety code as a community clinic I've seen physician assistants for last many years running these sham non-profit clinics all over California, and absolutely there is no oversight of it. So I want both to take an, uh, a closer look at this. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? No further questions at this time. Okay, great. Moving to agenda item three, approval of the me meeting minutes from the July 26-27, 2018 quarterly board meeting. I move to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones, please perform a roll call. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Are there any public comments from the audience? Any from the phone? Ms. Cruz Jones? No comments at this time. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Levine? Abstain. I was not at the meeting. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. I'm now moving to agenda item four, President's Report. Um, Dr. Lewis and I had calls with executive staff to discuss the meeting agenda and other board projects. Additionally, in late September, Ms. Kirschmeyer, Ms. Simones, and I met with Senator Hill and Assemblymember Lowe, chairs of the Senate and Assembly Business and Professional Committees. At these meetings, we discussed the vision and priorities of the board. I hope that we can continue to foster these relationships through my time as board president. Yesterday, Ms. Kirschmeyer and I presented at the Administrators in Medicine Fall Workshop. I presented on engaging the public and stakeholders and provided them with strategies for involving the community. At the last board meeting, I shared information regarding the launch of the board's new iOS license alert mobile application. I am proud to report we now have over 8,000 downloads and information about the mobile app is available in Spanish and English. Additionally, board staff has worked extremely hard to educate physicians about cures and the mandate that began on October 2nd. The board has participated in several webinars and pre presentations, developed an information flyer which is being used by the Department of Com Consumer Affairs, developed a frequently asked question, and in order to provide additional information to cures and users, and assisted hundreds of physicians and consumers answering their questions via email and phone calls. The board encourages all physicians to visit the board's website, mbc.ca.gov, for details on how to register for cures and details on the new mandatory use requirement. Are there any questions or comments, members, from the President's report? Are there any public comments from those in the audience? Are there any comments from those on the phone? No comments on the phone at this time. Okay. Moving to agenda item five, board member communications with interested parties. Do any board members have anything? Oh, Dr. Krause? Dr. Jacob Haivi and I spoke for a few minutes in reference to uh, the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. Dr. Gadea? Uh Yeah, as, uh, as I declared multiple times that I do talk to people at, uh, I'm on the AMPAC board, 
uh, people at AMA, people at CMA, people in the legislature, uh, uh, all the people. So, but they would do not discuss medical board issues. That's that's a separate. We all wear different hats, but we do not discuss medical board issues. Okay. Are there any comments from the audience? Any comments from the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay, great. The next agenda item, six, presentation and update on the Health Professions Education Foundation. I'd like to ask Ms. Asperg to come forward. Ms. Asperg is the Executive Director of the Health Professionals Education Foundation. Ms. Asperg. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Pleasure to be here. Um, before I start um, and present um, an overview uh, specifically on the Stephen M. Thompson Physician Core Loan Repayment Program, I'd like to recognize our board of trustees that are in the audience um, and also um, our, our member that's on the medical board, uh, Dr. Randy Hawkins. And I'm also accompanied by um, trustee Aaron Bizak and William Hendry. As a little girl, I never imagined I could be a doctor. I'm different, I have an accent. I don't represent the typical doctor. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Elizondo. I'm a family practice physician, MD. I work at Roy Ball Clinic, which is one of the many county clinics that serve Los Angeles. I'm originally from Boyle Heights. I'm one of seven kids. My dad was a migrant farm worker. He worked at any job he could get to he never earned more than the minimum wage, and my mom stayed home and took care of us. Growing up in East LA was challenging for my family, mostly for my parents. They were always worried that we would get shot and killed. There were a few instances where we got shot at while driving from elementary school home. We did see a few stabbings as kids one night coming home, but in other respects, we didn't lack anything. We were a happy, happy family. When I graduated from medical school, I was in debt. At the end of residency, I found out about the California Stephen Thompson Loan Repayment Program. I applied and received it. Essentially, you have your loans repaid as you work in these underserved communities. When I became a physician, I wanted to work in communities similar to where I grew up with people that were similar to my parents who struggled with first language, cultural barriers, and access to healthcare. Dentista, ¿tiene su dentista, señora? No. No, okay, la mando un dentista. My parents were patients in this clinic. They loved the physician who was fluent in Spanish. They would overhear other patients say they needed more doctors who spoke Spanish. I knew that I could be a great help to these communities as somebody they can feel comfortable with expressing their concerns. Patients who come from other countries feel comfortable with me because there's something about talking to somebody in their native language that forms a, a strong bond and they feel that you care more. Y empezó a hacer su ejercicio, ¿verdad? Sí. With the Stephen Thompson Loan Repayment Program, I was able to come back to these communities without having to worry about whether I was going to be able to pay back my loans. So I have a little bit extra money to do things like travel to third world countries and provide health care over there too. Primary care is, is one of the best fields in medicine for people that are interested in having more of a regular life where you can spend time with families, pursue other interests that you have. Spirituality is a vague term. What does this really mean? What I love most about medicine is that you can reach families, you can reach children at different levels. The more you expose them to positive role models, then the better their lives will be and the better citizens they will be. There is a great need for primary care physicians across the nation, especially in the inner city and rural parts of this country. Becoming a physician is very difficult, it's hard, but anything that's worth doing will require a lot of dedication and commitment. 
If being a doctor is what you want to be, follow your heart, because there will always be opportunities. Que si te sientes orgullosa de tus hijos y de tu hija que se hizo doctora. Pues esa pregunta ni se pregunta, claro. La vida puede ser muy difícil para muchas personas. Lo ha sido para mí. Cuando era chica nunca imaginaba ser una doctora, pero ahora lo soy. Si yo soy una doctora, tú también lo puedes ser. The Health Professions Education Foundation is a nonprofit within the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. To make a donation or apply for a financial incentive award, please visit oshpd.ca.gov forward slash HPEF. Well, that was a video um, provided by a grant from the California Endowment, and it's one of the four videos on our website um, of our testimonials of awardees that have received um, these financial incentive awards. As you can see, Dr. Elizondo is um, someone that exemplifies uh, the Health Professions Education Foundation's mission of improving access to health care um, by uh, providing cultural and linguistically competent services. Um, so as an overview, um, just to give you background, building upon my presentation from um, a few quarters ago, um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit that's housed within um, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. We were developed by the state legislature back in 1987, um, and our mission is to improve um, access to health care in underserved areas by providing these financial incentive awards. We do have um, not only a program for loan repayment for physicians, but we also have um, scholarships and other loan repayment programs for other professions, including nursing, allied healthcare, advanced practice, and mental health. So as a snapshot of our 2017-2018 um, um, fiscal year, um, we have provided awards um, of over um, 1,600 awards provided to providers um, up and down the state in the form of loan repayment. Um, these awards totaled up um, over $17 million. Um, in particular, for our Stephen M. Thompson Physician Corn Loan Repayment Program, we awarded um, $3.5 million with a total of 44 um, physicians um, awarded. Um, I also want to note um, of the total applications that we received, 407, um, of those 212 applications were deemed eligible but not awarded due to the limited funding. As I mentioned, um, we provide not only scholarships and loan repayment opportunities for physicians, but we um, also award a variety of other healthcare professions. Looking at the underserved areas of the state, um, the, this is something um, that we look for in um, applicants and, and those that we award. We want to make sure that they're um, compliant in, in providing services in a qualified facility. And some of those um, qualified facilities include those that are with the state and county. Um, in addition to that, um, correctional facilities, veteran affairs, medical centers, and Indian health centers. Um, some um, of our programs do require um, federal designation, um, and so those um, include uh, medically underserved areas, those that are um, health professional shortage areas in the state, as well as um, federally qualified health centers are qualifying facilities for our programs, as well as rural health clinics. We just closed an application cycle for our allied nursing and mental health um, programs. Um, couple weeks ago, um, we are in the midst of opening up our cycle for the Stephen Thompson program starting December 3rd. Um, and I also want to note we um, modified the deadline. Um, it's no longer February 27th. We're um, closing it on February 26th. Um, it's coinciding with our also open scholarship um, applications. And all of these applications are done online and can be um, done using the link listed. So specifically looking at the Stephen M. Thompson program, um, this is a program that we're seeking to increase the number of culturally and linguistically competent physicians um, throughout the state. Um, this program is funded um, by a $25 licensing fee from the medical board as well as the osteopathic uh, medical board of California. 
We also receive um, fines and um, penalty money from managed care in the form of one million. Um, and we previously, um, back in 2017, 18 fiscal year, um, we received a grant from the California Endowment. Um, that grant ended in fiscal year 17, 18. So those funds um, have expired. Um, and in terms of looking at the award amount, um, the award amount is up to $105,000 in exchange for three years of service. It is primarily um, focused on awarding primary care physicians um, and then those that are um, physicians um, practicing in geriatric settings. And then no more than 20% of our funding um, is directed to other specialties outside of um, primary care. So who can apply? Um, any doctor with an active MD or DO license, um, both primary care and specialty care are eligible. We look at um, a 40 hours per week uh, minimum requirement with 32 hours of direct patient care. For those that are um, OBGYN physicians, we look for a 20 one hour um, requirement for direct patient care. And lastly, uh, the qualifying factor is that um, this applicant must have a proof of um, educational debt. So some of the common specialties in terms of primary care, uh, we, we have awarded those that are in family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and um, OBGYN uh, physicians. Of other specialties, um, we've uh, received applications and have awarded those that are um, in surgery, um, practicing psychiatry, emergency medicine, and gerontology. This is an example of the certification of practice setting form that we require in the application. This is something that the applicant's um, supervisor or administrative officer would sign off, confirming that they work in a qualified facility, as well as um, meet, being able to meet the hour requirements um, of working at that site and direct patient care hours. So this map um, denotes our awardees in um, our fiscal year two years ago, 16-17. Um, um, we awarded uh, 91 doctors, and um, those doctors are denoted by the counties that are highlighted in blue. Um, and so we've um, been able to award many physicians um, in the Southern California region um, and continue to seek to award more physicians um, up north in, in rural areas of the state. Um, and this um, was, uh, was supported by um, funding at, at six, $6 million for the 91 um, physicians. And now looking at our last fiscal year, um, with the limited funding, um, we received at $3.5 million of licensure fee and penalties, fines, funding, um, we awarded a total of 44 doctors. And um, going into the, this um, fiscal year, 18-19, um, we're looking at approximately $2.3 million in funding um, for awards and approximately 22 physicians um, being awarded. And we're very active on um, social media uh, via Facebook, Twitter. You um, can contact us and follow us. Um, we provide many updates um, about our open application cycles, and uh, we plan to do so for Stephen Thompson um, in the coming months. Um, we're gearing up um, for outreach this November, um, and we can be contacted um, uh, via email, and we also listed our website and my contact information is there, and I also will leave um, some HPEF brochures behind. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, are there any comments? Dr. Hawkins, do you want to make a comment before I take other comments? Oh, briefly, thank you, Sasbrick. And it's a pleasure working on the uh, HPF my first year. Do you have any statistic about retention physician in these physician shortage areas or other specialists? That's a great question. This is something that we're seeking um, to do right now. Um, our, um, our organization is seeking to look into the retention of these providers. Um, we have done so with another program, our mental health loan assumption program, looking at the retention of those um, clinicians and providers in the public mental health setting. And so we're seeking to conduct a survey on retention this year. Great. Um, Deb? Thank you for coming, uh, actually. Steve Thompson was a friend of mine, so 
Um, there, there is another entity called Physicians for Healthy California. It's getting uh, a lot of money for scholarships, so mm. work with them. Lupe is the executive director. Yes. She is excellent. Yes. Currently, I'm on their board. I'm trying to get off in January. I've been on that board for 12 years. So work with them. There is a lot of money there. I think we need to make sure that appropriate people get the funding mm -hmm. uh, that is economically disadvantaged and socioeconomically disadvantaged. So that way, we can really attract these people to really come to, to California and also go through school here. Great. Thanks. Great. Lupe was um, also executive director at the Health Professions Education Foundation, so I will reach out to her. Thank you. Dr. Lewis. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was very enlightening. What we've heard mm -hmm. similar presentations, but this was very um, reaffirming mm -hmm. of what uh, the organization's about. I have just a couple statistical questions I'm yes. confused about. In the physician category, you had 403 applicants, mm -hmm. but you only awarded 44, but I don't understand how you make that designation of who wins the 44 and who says, no, thank you, we can't give you any money. The average debt, you know, for a three-year for a medical school, I mean, 60000 just for just for the tuition. Mm -hmm. So you say up to 105000 for three years. Mm -hmm. So I'm just confused about really how you decide. Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. Um, so we, we consider um, a variety of um, criteria. We look at their um, career goals, their dedication to service in underserved areas, and that's done through um, their personal statement. We also um, consider the number of years that they've practiced in an underserved area, so they obtain a score um, through, through that. Um, but the score is not the primary factor in deciding these physicians. We also look at geographic spread, um, and that is um, a requirement as of our regulations for the program is looking at the geographic spread of these awardees. So a lot of applications may come from LA County, but we are seeking to award um, those physicians um, in rural areas of the state where we haven't awarded in the past. And so that's something that the selection, uh, selection committee considers um, in their recommendation of, uh, of awardees. So um, just to follow on just for one, just for one second is you do you or do you not look at their current salary in their present position when you're making these uh, awards? No. When you're, you no. don't. No, we're looking at their educational debt. Hmm. And we're looking at the, the factor in which that they're working in community clinics or um, rural health clinics. We're looking at their designation of service. You know, there would be a disparity because in the correctionals, where, of which I came from, mm -hmm. The salaries are like definitely, highest. and that's so. something that the selection committee considers is is those settings in which um, providers are working in correctional facilities. And so, what we're seeking to what the committee has sought to do um, is award those that are working in com um, community based clinics. FQHC and yes, those and that's okay. a requirement as of our program. That yep. clears it up for me. Thank yep. you very much. Any other members have questions? Okay. No. Thank you, Ms. Asperg. I appreciate Thank you. that. Are there any comments from the audience? Any comments on the phone? No comments from the phone at this time. Okay. So moving to the next item, which is item seven, discussion and possible action on the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery's application for the specialty board equivalency recognition in California. This agenda item will discuss whether the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, or ABCS, meets the requirements of the California Business and Professional Code Section 651H5C and Title 16, Division 13, California Code of Regulations Section 1363.5 to be deemed equivalent to a board of the American Board of Medical Specialties. I will invite Ms. Alameda and Dr. Fleming 
to speak regarding Dr. Fleming's review of ABCS's application for equivalency to the ABMS boards and his findings. Thereafter, we'll invite speakers in opposition and speakers in support of approving ABC's, ABCS's application for equivalency for the ABMS boards to provide presentations. Following these presentations, we will invite public comments. Good afternoon, Thank April you. Alameda, Chief of Licensing. Um, if you could please just per, uh, turn to agenda item seven in your packet. The American Board of Cosmetic Surgery has applied to the board requesting recognition as a specialty board which would allow their members to advertise as board certified. Pursuant to Business and Profession Code section 651, a physician may only advertise that he or she is board certified if certified by the American Board of Medical Specialties a specialty board with an accredited council for graduate medical education accredited postgraduate training program, or a specialty board approved by the board as equivalent. In order to be approved as a specialty board, the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery must demonstrate its compliance with the laws and regulations and is equivalent to member boards of the American Board of Medical Specialties. Board staff and legal counsel conducted the initial review of their application and supporting documents then forwarded the complete file to Dr. Neil Fleming for final review. Dr. Fleming is a professor of clinical anesthesiology at the University of California, Davis, in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. Dr. Fleming is the direct director of cardiovascular and thoracic anesthesiology and vice chair for education. He is board certified and spent the majority of his career in academic practice of anesthesiology and is knowledgeable in the area of fellowship levels overseen by the ACGME and the ABMS. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Fleming for him to discuss the materials he reviewed, his report, and his overall findings. Thank you, I'll try and remember to speak into the microphone and speak slowly and clearly. Um, I, I believe you all have a copy of the report and I, I do not have a PowerPoint slide presentation to go with it. What I thought I would do is simply review the report and provide some highlights and some um, context. If at any point you have questions, please interrupt and, and ask. Um, or if there's anything you want expanded on, please don't hesitate. Um, the background, I, th I think, um, was provided. Um, it, I, I will admit that, that when I received this request, I was dropped into an area of controversy that I never knew existed. And so there has been a bit of a learning process in, in terms of my understanding the background and where we have been and, and where we are today. Um, the materials that I received were um, uh, th the three volumes of the application, which mercifully I hope you have not all had the opportunity to read. Um, rather intimidating co collection of, of documents. Um, in addition, I did also receive the um, reports from the prior uh, request from the American um, Board of Cosmetic Surgery for a, a similar uh, recognition uh, and a, a copy of, uh, of uh, the report that was associated with a request by the American Board of Sleep Medicine just to give some guidance as to format. Um, in addition to those documents, I, I did spend a fair amount of time uh, on the website for the American College of um, Cosmetic Surgery, which oversees the training um, um, uh, programs to provide additional background. And then subsequent to the submission of, of the report, I also received the rebuttal comments from the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. And so as I go through this, I, I will highlight some of the areas that additional information they provided, I think, requires some corrections uh, in the report. Um, the historical context, I, I think, that's, that's most important is, is the, the fact that a similar request had been made previously. And, and as I read through that discussion, I believe that the, the primary area of concern was that applicants entered this pathway from a variety, or entered this certification process from a variety of different residency backgrounds, um, very 
disparate in their training. Um, foremost among those discussions was a background training in dermatology, then um, whether or not that provided um, appropriate or adequate um, preparation for the fellowship training in cosmetic surgery. And I think as a result of those um, um, discussions and, and, and decisions, a number of fundamental changes were made in the, the fellowship program that I think should be highlighted. One change from the previous application to this one is that they, they, they have condensed a set of four separate sub-certifications into one common certification, so some simplification um, in that arena. They also eliminated, eliminated a, um, a background pathway of, of clinical experience um, as, as a way to enter into the certification program. And then they also eliminated, eliminated dermatology as a core residency training program for entrance into the um, program. Um, there, there was a query from the board with respect to the, the basically the grandfathering of those individuals. Uh, information was provided that it was a, actually a relatively small number of applicants that had entered through the dermatology pathway and a trivial number that were still um, certified in the program with that background. Um, there was no similar information provided for the clinical experience pathway, so I don't really have a sense as to where that sits. Um, so, um, reviewed the whole packet um, and, and tried to understand the background. Um, there, there are a number of, um, of um, components of this application that um, I think are relatively straightforward and, 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 and more administrative um, things like um, you know percent uh, representation on the on the governing boards uh, examination processes procedures um, and and components of that and those all seem to be um, reasonable uh, and uh, to the best of my knowledge uh, appropriate um, so primarily based on the the historical background um, and the primary concerns, the focus of my review was really on the fellowship training programs themselves and whether or not um, they, they met the criteria for equivalency. Um, I will point out that in my report, I highlighted one inconsistency in that the, the packet still included the dermatology pathway for entrance into the um, certification uh, process. and, and and that document apparently has been updated and a more current um, um, copy of the fellowship training guidelines has, has, has clarified that um, um, inconsistency. I also uh, did, was unable to find any um, core content outlines for the educational materials of the fellowship training programs. Um, and Subsequent to my comment here, the American Board of um, Plastic Surgery pointed out that those core content outlines are indeed available and they're a component of the, um, the fellowship handbook, um, which wasn't in the packets that I got, but is apparently avail is, is available on the website and, and a review of those does indeed have a, a version of um, content outlines to guide um, the didactic component of the training. It's relatively extensive and it's primarily procedure based. Um, the content outlined in the fellowship handbook is, is somewhat over in the range of 100 pages, which is relatively extensive. Tough to know how it can be handled in a year. In, in comparison, I know that the content outline for anesthesiology is a training program, a three year training program, is about 40 pages and a little bit more condensed and distilled, and I think better guidance, but um, um, that is available. Um, the, the one residual um, concern that was highlighted in, in the initial paragraph was there is still a, uh, there's, there's a kind of an outlier pathway for entrance into certification through ophthalmology followed by um, uh, um, ophthalmologic plastic surgical uh, two-year fellowship that then will provide entrance into the cosmetic surgery fellowship training program. This 
pathway is felt to be a little bit different and, and, and consequently requires a two-year fellowship training in cosmetic surgery rather than the standard one year, it is of some concern that the, um, the, the didactic component or the educational component for, to compensate for that, there's no modification other than an increased duration um, and uh, caseload requirement. Uh, so I think there is an opportunity for inconsistency in, in, the, in the training that is residual and, and somewhat akin to the dermatology background. With, with that, as, as the, with the training as a focus, I, I, I highlighted a couple of things here um, in the report that I th think are key to an assessment of the, um, the fellowship training guidelines. The guidelines as provided are, are pretty straightforward and, and, and consistent, if not identical, to many standard ACGME fellowship training guidelines. Um, I think that the key is to figure out if indeed the fellowship training programs adhere to those guidelines. And, and, the, and the problem I had was that I, there's no um, self-evaluation, no feedback, no follow-up information on any of the fellowship training programs. In an attempt to try and get a sense of the quality of the training is what drove me to spend a fair amount of time on the fellowship training website to try and sort through whether or not these programs met the, the requirements as outlined. This is not an ideal source of material and I understand the limitations of that. Um, there is maybe a Wikipedia equivalent. I, I, I realize that um, th th that evaluation cannot be quantitative. It was intended to be relatively qualitative and to try and get a sense as, as to how these programs adhered to the training guidelines. Um, and, and that is the reason that I, that I highlighted the particular items um, that are listed in the report. Um, I will um, say that subsequent to the um, uh, comments by the American Board of um, uh, Cosmetic Surgery, um, this, the initial comment in the review of training programs that I made here on um, uh, item seven, attachment one, page seven, that there's no distinction provided as to which programs are provided for the two fellowship training programs that are supervised by the American College of Cosmetic Surgery is incorrect. That, that data is there, um, and if you spend a little more time, you can you can you can discern which. And so the the numbers that I provided are are not accurate in terms of total numbers of programs. I believe they have a correction. There's about 25 programs, but I believe that the general comments are are still applicable. Um, I, I think the the one place I struggled was in in basically the um, the expectation um, that program directors for these programs have academic appointments um, and be engaged in verifiable scholarly activities and foster an environment that educates the fellows both in the core competencies that are clearly outlined in the in the training guidelines and that and that these program directors maintain a, a, a high quality didactic and clinical education. It's, it's that, that core competency of medical education that I think spins from that requirement. And, and that's the component that um, I spent the, the longest time trying to figure out if it was there. Um, the academic appointments are, are nowhere to be seen. I don't know if they exist or not, but they simply are not highlighted or emphasized uh, in, the, in the program presentations at all. The verifi verifiable scholarly activity is another place that I struggled. There's a wide variation in terms of, of quantity and quality. The best I could do to try and get some sort of objective measure was to, to simply do a quick um, PubMed search to, to find, you know, um, um, indexed uh, publications by each of the program directors and and it varied widely from zero to over a hundred um, depending upon the individual but clearly not consistent um, and I think that the other final piece is is just to try and get a sense whether the the the, the program director expectation that they foster an environment that 
that educates in the, in the core competencies that are required and, and expected with an ACGME certified uh, fellowship training, um, maintaining that, that, that environment for not only a clinical experience pathway, but to establish the, um, the didactic foundation that will allow um, a graduate to uh, continue to practice in a specialty because so much changes so fast. Everything that I learned as, as a resident has, has changed it. And without that, that core didactic foundation, you can't um, evolve as the, as the practice evolves. Um, and I think that's the, the chunk that's, um, that's, just, that's just missing. I, I can't find it. Um, the other highlights there um, in terms of what is, what is addressed on the, on the, um, the summary site are, are listed. For your review. So I think in the overall assessment summary, um, I would probably reemphasize the clarification that um, my comment with respect to the um, dermatology pathway that is now consistently handled, and so so that comment in the summary is in, is inaccurate. As is the absence of a content outline. There is a content outline, although. Um, I think that many of the components of the content outline don't also address the expectations of the fellowship, uh, especially with respect to um, uh, scholarly activity, uh, training in um, data analysis and, and quality improvement projects. That, that's not a component of, of the content outline, but is an expectation, expectation in, the, in the fellowship training. So I think that's um, still a problem. I think ophthalmology and, and ophthalmologic uh, um, plastic surgery as an alternative pathway still presents um, an opportunity for inconsistent background and, and training that is of some concern. Um, but I think that the primary problem is that um, I, I just was unable to get the data that could convince me that, um, that the fellowship training programs truly adhered to the um, to, to the spirit of the training guidelines as, as written, uh, especially with an emphasis on the, um, the core competency in terms of medical knowledge. Uh, the, the focus really appears to be on um, clinical um, service and, and um, clinical exposure, which I think is, is unfortunately too limited to, um, to make this whole fellowship system be considered as, as equivalent to um, American Board of Medical Specialties. That's the kind of highlighted synopsis, I, I think, um, and would be more than happy to entertain any questions or clarifications. which means it's either very good or very bad. You can, you can open it up for questions. And okay. Okay. So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to hold on, because can he come back up? Okay. So we're going to hold okay, on thanks. members asking questions until we've heard from both sides. And then, Dr. Fleming, we may have you come back up. Whatever, maybe questions whatever you need, you more than specifically. happy. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you both. Um, we appreciate the work that you put into this, um, the amount of time that you committed to doing this. Um, I would like to invite those presenting in opposition to ABCS's application for equivalency to come up to present. Please note that your presentation must be kept to 20 minutes or less. Would you like a five-minute warning? Yes. Okay. There we go. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Michael Wong. I'm the president of the California Society of Plastic Surgeons, and I'm also professor and program director of plastic surgery at UC Davis School of Medicine. Uh, thank you for allowing us to present about the American Board of Apple. American Board of Cosmetic Surgery's uh, application for equivalency. So 
So in order to be deemed equivalent, the ABCS needs to be shown to be equivalent to a related ABMS board. The most appropriate board for comparison is really the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, American Board of Plastic Surgery, excuse me. Uh, so over the next few slides, I'm gonna share with you um, a comparison between the, Amer the AACS, uh, General Cosmetic Surgery Fellowship, and contrast that with ACGME Plastic Surgery Residency Training Programs. I'll cover prerequisite training of the ABCS diplomats, AACS program directors, AACS fellowship program environment, and then I'll hand off the baton to my colleague, Dr. Johnson, who will talk about professionalism among current California ABCS members. Prerequisite training of the ABCS diplomats is clearly not sufficient nor equivalent to plastic surgery residency training. Because of accepted entrance pathways are varied, there is clearly variable exposure to relevant anatomy, variable knowledge of disease processes that affect the anatomy, and clearly variability in surgical experience of the trainees and the skills that they acquire and the techniques they learn. This results in variable foundations important clinical knowledge. Training in surgical anatomy and pathology is clearly required for safe surgical practice. The General Cosmetic Surgery Fellowship of the AACS purports to train in total body cosmetic surgery, training from head to toe. However, variable prerequisite training pathways result in variable training in surgical anatomy and pathology. General surgeons, obstetricians and gynecologists, ophthalmologists, otolaryngologists, and OMFS specialists all have their own subset of knowledge, and as shown here in green. In contrast, plastic surgery training covers the whole body of surgical anatomy and pathology training, again, from head to toe. One big area of cosmetic surgery is that of the breast. You can see these physician specialists here have notable deficiencies in knowledge of anatomy and pathology of the breast. Continuing with deficiencies extend to also general surgeons, and it's not just to the breast, but the entire body. This is the enormous task that's left in front of the AACS, the educational task to consistently provide training across all areas of anatomy and pathology and surgical procedures and techniques in order to be deemed safe cosmetic surgeons. The current, the AACS has worked very hard to produce program requirements that look very similar to ACGME uh, accredited programs. However, as Dr. Fleming pointed out, it's hard to say that they meet these AACS requirements with regards to program directors, institutional commitments, facilities and resources, educational programs, adherence and attention to core competencies, required scholarly activities, and salary and stipends. One year AACS fellowship training is clearly insufficient and not equivalent to plastic surgery residency training for it clearly lacks consistent curriculum and educational milestones to be met by fellows. There's clearly a high degree of variability in the breadth of patient experiences and the, of patient care. There's definitely variability in the didactics and the educational opportunities available to trainees. And this is not surprising, as most of the education occurs in private practice-based standalone facilities where the learning is from typically limited faculty. Moreover, there's minimal oversight of the programs, and if it does occur, it's done through a conflicted third-party fellowship review committee that's appointed by the AACS. The majority of the AACS fellowship directors clearly do not meet current program director requirements with regards to academic affiliations, verifiable published scholarly activity, selecting and supervising of additional faculty clearly does not occur because most of the programs are only single faculty, that of the program director themselves. In order to emphasize and demonstrate this point, I'm gonna uh, discuss 
the 31 AACS fellowship directors in of the AACS and contrast that with the eight program directors of the California Society uh, of the California uh, Society of Plastic Surgeons. Let's look at the academic appointments. And by doing so, I'm clearly going to demonstrate that the AACS program directors are not equivalent um, and pale in comparison to the California plastic surgeons uh, program directors. Academic appointments in the AACS fellowship program directors can only number about 25%. 25% of these fellowship directors have academic appointments that are discernible. 100% contrast that with the California uh, plastic surgeons. If you want to use PubMed as a means of trying to verify academic output over the last 10 years, you can see that only 27% of AACS fellowship directors had verifiable PubMed publications, in contrast to 100% of the California Plastic uh, Surgery Program directors. If you look at the total number of publications by their fellowship directors, only 64 can be found. In contrast, 470 publications by California's plastic surgery program directors during the same time period. That's an average of 2.1 publications per program director on the AACS side. Contrast that with 58.8 publications by California plastic surgery program directors. This is not surprising when you consider where the training is occurring. Most of these trainings are done in AACS uh, fellowships are done in non-academic, standalone, private practices. Contrast this with where the training occurs for California residency programs that are clearly academic, focused primarily and heavily on education, and have the backing of the large university hospital systems. Institutional personnel and resources are also not equivalent. Typically in an AACS uh, fellowship, they have an office manager, 1.2 faculty per program, which is essentially the program director, and access to the program director library. Contrast this with California, where there are huge departments dedicated to graduate medical education. In California, there are almost 10 faculty per program, and they have the huge health system libraries for their learners. Let's look at educational programming. The AACS, in their description of their fellowships, only 28% even mention an educational program, and only 16% discuss weekly didactics. Recognizing the isolation of their learners and the poor resources that they have, there are now some indication that they have monthly webinars that uh, link some of these programs. Contrast this with uh, my program at UC Davis, which has numerous conferences such as Grand Rounds, preoperative conferences, outcome conferences, journal clubs, research conferences, hot seats, departmental M&Ms, as well as weekly core curriculum, cadaver labs, art classes, and filler workshops, just to name a few. What about educational program resources? Only mentioned in 12.5 percent of the uh, descriptions of the fellowship programs and they'll do some general statements that state that they have access to a quote unquote extensive library. Contrast this with my program. Each of the residents has a personal subscription to the two leading journals in plastic surgery. They have access to online resources associated with the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, uh, Plastic Surgery Educational Network, and our sister aesthetic society and their radar app and clearly, have, clearly they have access to all the faculty libraries and the entire University of California Health System Library. As we discussed, <coughs> core competencies is a key focus of any ACGME recognized training program. Unfortunately, it seems like AAC, AACS does not spend a bunch of time on this. If you, they do give a nod to general goals and objectives that may say, state something like this. The fellows are involved with all aspects of cosmetic surgery practice, whatever that means, in contrast to our programs that have ed educational curriculum and milestone evaluations that are all designed around the six core competencies. These include medical knowledge, patient care, 
system-based practice, practice-based learning, professionalism, and communication skills. At the, every single clinical rotation that we have in our uh, institution has specific goals and objectives that address each of these six core competencies. And in line with the, the National ACGME Milestone Project, uh, we have milestone evaluations that occur after each clinical rotation, evaluating each of our residents in 35 metrics or milestones that includes medical knowledge and patient care in 14 separate areas of specialty. There's also the requirement for scholarly activity, and this is only mentioned in 28.1% of uh, descriptions of fellowships, with only 18.8% uh, discussing an expectation for academic output and a support to an annual meeting. 15.6% only mentioned that it, they require some manuscript to be published, and this all begs the question of how are they really adhering to this requirement of scholarly activity. Contrast this with my program at UC Davis the last academic year. All nine of my residents were involved in research. Uh, this resulted in 10 publications, resulted in publication of six book chapters, and 14 national and state presentations. Finally, let's look at salary support. 59.4% of program descriptions mention that there's a stipend. This ranged between $24,000 and $54,000 for an average of $34,000 of annual support a year. Because the salary support is so low, 15.6% of them mentioned that moonlighting as a possibility or even encouraged it to help support uh, their trainees. And so this begs, begs the question about whether or not they're respecting the 80-hour work restriction, which as you know is put in place to provide learners with ample time to study uh, rest and recreate. So an a average ACGME fifth year salary uh, is about $63,000. Um, at my program, we don't allow any moonlighting, like most programs across the country because of the impact they can have on learning. And we certainly strictly adhere to the 80 hour work week rule. So to conclude, I'd like to read a sentence out of uh, Dr. Uh, Fleming's report. When annual stipends that run as low as one-third current ACGME approved fellowship salaries are combined with caseloads averaging four to five cases per day, it is hard to envision this training as anything other than low-cost, high-volume service support that cannot be considered equivalent to other approved specialty training certifications. Uh, thank you for your kind attention, and I will now turn the podium over to my colleague, Dr. Johnson. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Deborah Johnson. I'm a private practice plastic surgeon from Sacramento, California, a former uh, president of the California Society, uh, past president of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, and a current director of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, and I serve as an e expert reviewer for the Medical Board of California. Our plastic surgical societies, as well as the American Board of Plastic Surgery, place a premium on professionalism. It's a key part of our trainees' core curriculum and is then evaluated in our candidates for certification and in our diplomats as they participate in the continuing certification program. As you can see, we obtain from each candidate and diplomat all of their marketing materials they've used in the prior year, including websites, print advertising, office brochures, letterhead, et cetera, to check for uh, the integrity of their and the authenticity of their advertising. We also look at billing coding in each candidate's nine-month case list submitted to qualify for the oral certifying exam. We want to assure that each candidate has adequate volume to select appropriate cases on which to examine them, that he or she is billing appropriately, and that case documentation is complete and follows standards of practice. Five minutes. We will hear later from the ABCS about their professionalism, and I'm sure their conversation will be impressive. However, we have found the reality to be less so. 
We have heard discussion of the educational content of their fellowships, and Dr. Wong has presented our concerns that a one-year fellowship does not adequately prepare a surgeon working outside the scope of his or her primary training to be a safe cosmetic surgeon. In fact, we did some secret shopping and emailed a California AACS fellowship director's office regarding an interest in breast augmentation, but wondering whether the doctor or his fellow would perform the surgery. As you can see from this reply in which we've redacted the names, the office staff reports that the fellow only watches the surgery and the doctor does all the work. Also, that the fellow is only present every other week. And finally, that the fellow is only present three of those work days. Assuming the fellow watches surgery three days a week for 26 weeks a year, that means he or she spends 78 total days learning how to perform whole body cosmetic surgery. Pardon me, but this is laughable. We are here today to decide whether members of the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery can advertise themselves as board certified. However, our perusal of the personal websites of each of the California members of the ABCS showed that 26 of them already claim to be board certified. In fact, the national website for ABCS touts its board certified cosmetic surgeons. The national website can be queried for ABCS members in California, and you can see that it recommends board certified cosmetic surgeons in California, which is a violation of California law. In fact, I have in my hand 26 complaints I'm going to file with the medical board and the osteopathic board regarding these board certification claims requesting enforcement of the current law regarding misleading advertising. Finally, while the ABCS has buffed and shined its requirements for membership over the past 20 years, many of the current members, not a few uh, of the 81 California members, cannot meet current standards. Several of them have no prerequisite surgical training. Several have never been board certified at all. And several have joined under the experience route that was available until 2014. And some never completed a fellowship. If the medical board does decide to approve this request for equivalency, these non-qualifying members would be able to ride the coattails of the ABCS and claim board certification. We ask you to understand that this is not a turf battle, that this is not an us against them situation. Any doctor is free to advertise themselves as a cosmetic surgeon, and every patient is allowed to freely choose who they would wish to provide a cosmetic surgery service. But board certification is a high mark of achievement for physicians. We, American Board of Plastic Surgeons Certified Surgeons, have worked hard to achieve our certification, and we continue to work hard to maintain our certification. Board certification informs the public that a physician has been trained, tested, and evaluated. Certification provides an assurance of the knowledge and safe practice to the public. Certification matters to us. Please don't allow it to be diminished by this application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Now I would like to um, invite those presenting in support of ABCS's application for equivalency to come up and present. Please note your presentation must be kept to 20 minutes or less. Would you folks like a five minute warning as well? We'll take that. Thank okay. you. Good afternoon, President Pines, members of the board. John Valencia, counsel for the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, and the California Association, California Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, all of which support the ABCS de novo new petition for specialty recognition 
of the cosmetic surgery specialty for advertising in California in order to use the phrase board certified pursuant to state law that you've heard referenced. The December 2015 ABCS petition, voluminous additional materials submitted for the record since then, and today's presentation will demonstrate that ABCS exceeds, let alone meets, the criteria required in California law warranting specialty recognition. We expect, too, that board counsel will, as needed, help guide your deliberations in light of key national developments in the field of state regulation of health professional advertising. The U.S. Supreme Court's decision in North Carolina Board of Dental Examiners versus FTC, the U.S. Court of Appeals Fifth Circuit decision in American Academy of Implant Dentistry versus the members of Technus, uh, the Texas Board of Dental Examiners, and the most recent September 2018 U.S. Department of Justice uh, opinion letter to the Maryland Ge General Assembly in which the DOJ encouraged that body to uh, work, quote, to allow additional entry by additional legitimate certifying bodies, close quote, into the field of credentialing. The ABCS presentation will also expressly rebut the facial deficiencies in the reviewer's presentation and in the opinions reached. The medical board may also appreciate that there is no small irony that its own reviewer presents as a credential board certification by a non-ABMS, non-ACGME, non-medical board recognized board. Our presentation continues with Peter Canalia, Executive Director, American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. Thank you, Madam Chairperson and members of the board. The American Board of Cosmetic Surgery was founded in 1979 with the mission to serve the public by promoting the safe and, effect and eth ethical practice of cosmetic surgery. The interest in cosmetic surgery has grown exponentially over the past 50 years. The recognition of that increase of interest in performance of cosmetic and aesthetic elective procedures and are the very reason for the foundation and the existence of the ABCS. During the period of this time, it is important to note that the ABCS is the only board dedicated exclusively to certifying physicians in cosmetic surgery. Physician board certification is a voluntary process by which a physician may demonstrate his or her mastery in a specialty and or a subspecialty. This is achieved through rigorous training, examination, and continuing education. In defining a credible certification board, certain basic elements, inclu uh, including a psychometrically evaluated oral and written examination, appropriate recertification, full-time staff, and proper legal organization are all necessary. The definition of a credible certifying board, however, is not limited to the American Board of Medical Specialties, as evidenced uh, by the MBC already recognizing four independent boards as equivalent to the ABMS boards. Uh, we our purpose today is to illustrate the ABCS is a valid and credible certifying board that the Medical Board of California should recognize as an ABMS equivalent for advertising purposes. The information supporting those statements have previously been sent to you in multiple volumes. At this time, I'd like to turn the matter over to Dr. Alex Sobel, our current president. Good afternoon and thank you. I'm Alex Sobel, uh, sitting president of the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, and I'd like to specifically address the, uh, the uh, rebuttal, uh, excuse me, the, the deficiencies is submitted uh, by the medical uh, board reviewer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fleming, for uh, addressing some of the corrections. Uh, there were multiple inaccuracies in that report. Uh, the following are addressable issues of acute deficiencies that must be questioned. And first and foremost, uh, we'd asked, uh, you know, did the reviewer go beyond the online summaries of the AACS fellowship? Uh, there are hyperlinks on the AACS website that link directly to the fellowship tr uh, training guidelines as well as the, uh, as the uh, clinical uh, uh, program uh, training requirements, excuse me, training requirements. Uh, number two, did the reviewer conduct a, a site visit of any fellowship program or speak with the fellowship director or a fellow uh, in training? 
Uh, he did not, he would have been certainly more informed about uh, not only our environments of care, but to his concern, what do our academic environments uh, specifically look like and how we uh, homogenize uh, the educational uh, training and not just the uh, surgical experience among the uh, 27 uh, general cosmetic surgery fellowships. And thirdly, did the reviewer request the AACS uh, fellowship curriculum, which was not accessible on the, uh, the online? Uh, no, he didn't, but we did make that available. Example, uh, Dr. Fleming did correct uh, the dermatology item. Uh, dermatologists have not been uh, certified uh, by any ABCS pathway since 2004, and that, uh, that pathway is extinct. Uh, specifically to ophthalmology, we're very clear that ophthalmologists uh, who have successfully completed their ACGME or AOA BOS program must complete a two-year ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery fellowship certified by ASOPERS prior to even becoming eligible uh, to, uh, to engage in a two-year AACS accredited general cosmetic surgery fellowship. Affirmatively, uh, the AACS fellowships uh, both, uh, uh, well, not only meet but exceed the current ACGME standards because they provide quality clinical training in accredited facilities only to ensure patient safety and care in a specialty that is exponentially growing with little oversight. Now, I think uh, those in the room who appreciate that most cosmetic surgery is performed outside of the hospital setting will also appreciate how important it is to train in the environment of care where, you're, where you will be eventually practicing. This is essential for patient safety. Number two, the number of cases performed in AACS fellowships are reflective of concentrated training that exceeds ACGME requirements within aesthetic plastic surgery residency. We'll show that in the next slide. Thirdly, uh, we've submitted uh, studies to the board included in your bibliography in support of this position, excuse me, in support of this petition, demonstrate increased surgical case volume correlates with better patient outcomes. In column A, we have the current ACGME requirements, aesthetic plastic surgery training programs, and column B are the median number of procedures performed in, in a cosmetic surgery fellowship. And as you can see, there is incredible disparity between the minimum requirements in ACGME programs uh, versus what our uh, median numbers performed in the actual fellowships are. And I will tell you that overall, our fellows approximate 600 cosmetic procedures in one year. We think that the density, breadth, and depth is especially important to highlight, but also the PGY or postgraduate year status of the trainee. PGY 6, 7, and 8s perform at a much different level than PGY 3, 4, 5, and 6. I'd be glad to entertain any questions at this point from board members. If not, back to Peter Canelia. Musical chairs. As the uh, executive director, it was my responsibility to craft that petition that we submitted with the supporting documentation. I mentioned earlier that there are certain uh, elements, minimum elements that you have to have in a credible board, and I just wanted to point out several of your requirements are met. Uh, as we've submitted, uh, we're certainly a nonprofit corporation organized under Section 501C6 with over 100 members in 41 states. Uh, we have the requisite board structure, uh, including uh, term limits for our trustees and our officers that are in conformance with your requirements. There's a requisite uh, revenue apportionment requirements as far as the amount of funds that can be used for uh, uh, operation expenses, which we've documented by submitting our financial statements for the multiple years before after we submitted, as well as a letter from our accountant that explains that. And finally, we have the single core certificate for general cosmetic surgery, a sample of which I have if you'd like to see it. With that said, I turn the program over to Dr. Jacob Hayavi. Good afternoon, distinguished board members. I'm going to talk to the substantive requirements that we fulfill in this law. 
Uh, ABCS has been in existence for nearly 40 years. We were not here as of yesterday. And the reason for our existence is to make sure that people that are practicing in this arena are practicing to higher standards and in patient safety. In addition, the American Medical Association recognizes cosmetic surgery as a subspecialty for over 16 years. We have two delegates to the House of Delegates at the AMA. We serve on multiple committees in the AMA. The American Board of Cosmetic Surgery qualifies and examines candidates across the breadth of cosmetic surgery. Our colleagues, with all due respect, think that they are the only ones that should be practicing the specialty. We are not applying for equivalency to plastic surgery. We are applying for equivalency to be recognized as a specialty that is an ABMS specialty. The next slide. In regards to criteria two, the specialty board shall not restrict itself to a single modality. As you can see, many different backgrounds have contributed to this field. Cosmetic surgery does not belong to one specialty. This is a short list of different procedures, next slide please, of different procedures that cosmetic surgeons perform. This is not an all-inclusive list. This just shows the depth and breadth of this specialty. Cosmetic surgery in regards to requirement three is a surgical subspecialty. We only certify physicians. We do not certify non-physicians. Another important point that was brought up by me and it was wrong. We do not certify non-surgeons. We only certify people that have completed primary surgical residency and have already a primary board certification. In regards to criteria 5B, which are the requirements and policies for certification. ABCS certification is psychometrically evaluated and requires and already a completion of a primary ACGME residency in one of the specialties listed. In addition to completing that residency, all of our applicants must have a primary board certification that is already an ABMS board certification, an AOA, RCPSC, or an ABOMS recognized board certification in the following specialties, general surgery, plastic surgery, otolaryngology, obstetrics and gynecology, ophthalmology with completion of an ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery fellowship, and an American Board of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery with an MD degree. In addition to that, all applicants must complete an accredited AACS fellowship. After completing the fellowship, they must pass a rigorous written and oral examination that is psychometrically validated by the NBOME. They must contain an unrestricted license, allopathic or osteopathic license, and all applicants must have valid evidence of privileges in a hospital or an accredited outpatient facility. In addition, we require that all of our diplomats must maintain advanced cardiac life support certification because cosmetic surgery is performed in an outpatient facility. In regards to requirement 5C, to promote the public interest, our diplomats contribute in many different ways. I will highlight a few of them. The rest of them you have in writing. ABCS diplomats are contributing to public interest through appointments in medical, uh, in state medical and osteopathic medical boards such as yours across different states. In addition to serving on boards, we are uh, members of the FSMB and different state boards seek our diplomats for expert witnesses. We have expert witnesses that are sitting here among us that help your board uh, do the same uh, tasks. Our diplomats publish articles on safety in cosmetic surgery in peer-reviewed journals and ma many other uh, requirements that you have, you have seen and I'm, I'm going to skip them for the sake of time. In regards to 5D, in regards to the determination of adequate preparation, all of our applicants first uh, get a review by the credentialing committee. Uh, the staff and the credentialing committee prepare the entire packet and make sure that everything that we mentioned in 5B meets the standard. After that has been determined, the applicant's application is presented to the entire board and there is discussion in regards to the application and there is a vote whether or not 
that the application is going to be approved or denied for the examination. Five minutes. In regards to 5E, the ABCS verifies all candidates through multiple routes, through AMA physician profile, board certification through ABMS and the listed entities as well as the FSMB. We require that our fellows per, uh, perform a minimum of 300 procedures, 50 in each category listed above. I'll skip to F. Um, in regards to the comprehensive evaluation of our candidates' knowledge and experience. After completion of the fellowship, as mentioned, the candidates must pass a rigorous written and oral examination that is psychometrically validated by, by the National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners. In regards to requirement six, as it pertains to the standard for de determining that those who possess the knowledge and skills essential to provide competent care as designated in the specialty. All American Board of Cosmetic Surgery board certified physicians must recertify every 10 years. They must maintain operating privileges in good standing at a hospital or an accredited facility. All board certified physicians must maintain a current ACLS certification. They all have to have zero reprimands from any professional organization, federally funded program, and medical staff memberships, and many other requirements. For the sake of time, I'm still going to. Go to the next slide. ABCS, most importantly, utilizes the FSMB Physician Disciplinary Reporting Services, which monitors any practice violation or accusations against our diplomats. And they, we, we immediately take action in real time. If we know that the diplomat has a reprimand, their board certification is nullified and an investigation is sent. In regards to requirement eight, our Opposition here talked about residency. We are not talking about a residency. We are talking about a post-residency training. ACGME residency training in cosmetic surgery does not exist. ACGME residencies are federally funded. They are paid by taxpayer dollars. I doubt that we will ever have a federally funded residency in cosmetic surgery. It's just not going to happen. Specialties such as elective cosmetic surgery have been fast growing and are evolving over the last two decades, which we firmly believe calls for greater oversight and regulation so that we may collectively ensure the very safety of the patients that we take oath to protect. In regards to 8B, all ABCS applicants and its board certified physicians must complete a primary ACGME residency as said. The AACS fellowships provide identifiable training in cosmetic surgery. So the six core competencies that they showed you are already provided in the primary residency, exact same six core competencies. In addition to that, the fellowship provides additional identifiable training in cosmetic surgery as spelled out in the core competencies that Dr. Fleming could not find online, but it exists. In addition, the AACS fellowship review committee developed these strict guidelines and they revise and update it on an ongoing basis because the specialty is evolving and we want to make sure that we are at the highest standard of care. Eight B is not like that. In regards to uh, requirements criteria nine, as set forth in eight B above and described in detail and as stated by the medical board reviewer himself, the AACS fellowship training guidelines for certification in cosmetic surgery are consistent with other specialty residency and fellowship training guidelines. They are online, they're available. They are 27 general cosmetic surgery programs right now, not 32. In regards to, as it pertains to the ABCS examination process and testing, the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery applicants, after completing a fellowship, must pass the exam that is psychometrically evaluated, and that psychometric evaluation and the process is very tedious. Each item on the exam is edited and tested for validity. New questions are added to the pool on a yearly basis and old ones are retired. Each question is subject to the same rigorous process during each test development cycle. And this has been submitted and explained to you. So we meet and exceed this criteria as evidenced by the correspondence that was sent by our psychometric evaluators from the NBOME. In regards to requirement 12, as it pertains to maintaining and elevating standards of graduate medical education and assisting accrediting agencies, we meet this requirement in multiple different ways, and I'll just go over a few of them due to the shortness of time. 
Our diplomats have served on the AAAC board and have helped develop standards for accreditation. Time. Stop or continue? Time. Thank you. If there are any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to bring Dr. Fleming back to the mic. Are there any questions or comments from the members? Dr. Gananadev? Thank you. Uh, for the ABC, yes, I, uh, I see your plight, but from 1970s on, there were no boards which were created by multiple specialties. I'll give you an example. Pediatric surgery, vascular surgery, colorectal surgery. These were all brand new boards which were created with the ABMS approval and the ACGME certification. I'm just curious if you have a D, a really vigorous program, why don't you go that route? If I understand your question, you're saying why aren't we applying to ABMS directly? Why aren't you going through the ACGME for uh, a certification of your fellowship and then go through ABMS for uh, fellowship certification. That's what vascular surgery did. That's what colorectal surgery did. Uh, the answer to that is very simple, Dr. Granadev. I said during the presentation, cosmetic surgery is elective surgery. ACGME programs are funded by uh, Medicare money, Medicare dollars and taxpayer dollars. There are no ACGME programs in cosmetic surgery, and I doubt that there will ever be. We do not fit that model. You cannot fit a round peg into a square hole. It's never going to happen because we don't fit that model. And you're right, there are, I, there are actually in existence multiple specialties and we continue to see multiple specialties come up that certify in one specialty, most recently addiction medicine, multiple different backgrounds. And I can show you, you just go to the ABMS website. There is nearly 35 programs like that. You guys approved several of them. Spine surgery, spine surgery, orthopedics and neurosurgeons, hand surgery. I'll stop here, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Dr. Krause? I have uh, two questions uh, for all concerned parties, uh, and they're not necessarily related questions. A lot of this decision-making for many of us on the board is uh, learning as we go. Uh, and we've digested a lot of material uh, just over the last few weeks on this matter. But sometimes we overlook that other circumstances, other times, other states have gone through the same processes. So my two questions are, one, what have other states done on this issue? And number two, this matter came before the board way before any of us were on the board, and it was denied at that time. And I'm wondering if the facts and the circumstances are different today than they were then. Is today's ABCS a different organization, a more robust organization, than it was when it was denied over a decade ago? So I, I think those both fall into that table, don't they? Uh, thank you for the question. The, uh, is the ABCS a different entity now than it was the last time we, we, we applied? The answer is yes. At the, after the results of the last petition, we had hired us outside counsel, outside specialists to come in and tell us what we had to do to make sure we met and exceeded all the requirements of the California Medical Board's regulation. Uh, we went through an extensive s period of time when we did that. We eliminated different things that we that was suggested would be a problem and we eventually came to the point where we are now where we believe we meet and exceed all those requirements. As far as other states, there's three states we've applied for a recognition. One would be Oklahoma, which were recognized as an equivalent to an ABMS board. The second would be Texas, where we're recognized as an equivalent to an ABMS board. By the way, our plastic colleagues have indicated that the Texas Board and the Oklahoma Board have made a mistake by making that decision. 
And finally, uh, we did apply in Florida, and in Florida, there's a, you can advertise your board certification, but you have to include a disclaimer that you're not an ABMS board. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. Dr. Levine. Thank you to, to all parties for the extensive work that's gone into this. I had a, the, there are 27 fellowships, is that correct? And I had a question about the range of the size of the fellowships among the 27 um, in terms of faculty and also number of fellows in each program and also what the college does in terms of site visits, uh, on-site review prior to approving a fellowship program. Yeah, the uh, fellowship review committee requires uh, on-site site visits uh, as well as uh, affirmative evidence that the uh, fellowship program has met each and every element of the fellowship uh, uh, training program requirements. Um, some have been uh, uh, alluded to or erroneously in, in, in the prior presentation, um, but they include um, uh, the availability of a substantial library as well as uh, online journal access. Also, the fellowship training programs need to demonstrate that if they are housed in one single facility, that the fellows have access to accredited uh, associate faculty for a variety of exposure and training. For example, my fellowship training program uh, has uh, 14 accredited fellowship uh, training uh, faculty members from a variety of primary specialty, uh, uh, four of them being uh, uh, general plastic surgeons, two being oculoplastics, uh, uh, and uh, it also include uh, um, uh, facial plastic and reconstructive surgeons. Um, the uh, ongoing process of recertification for the fellowship training programs uh, in terms of major survey, I believe, is now set at, at, at every three years, but on an annual affirmation, uh, the programs uh, register that they're in compliance with the uh, clinical training guidelines. And the size or the number of fellows? Sorry. The size and number of fellows range from one to two, depending on the, uh, the availability of training faculty. Uh, in my program, I train two. Dr. Dr. Lewis. Thank you, everybody, for the extensive uh, presentation. We have reams of paper we've all gone through um, for both uh, both sides. And uh, I always think that an affirmation of a, a process is that you might have opposing s sides. I hate to use the word opposing sides, but you know, uh, other parties accept your program and be willing to be faculty for your program. Let's say there's, um, there's a doctor in American who's ABMS uh, certified in plastic surgery, and I'd like to know how many of those uh, individuals are also faculty or instructors for your, um, for your specialty program. You, you understand the question? I, I think I understand the question, and, and we have uh, some uh, slides and, and more data that we can uh, present, but on a much broader level, uh, please understand that the academic organization, the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery, uh, has several member, member plastic surgeons, in fact, in, in recent history to have served a, a, as president. Um, and many uh, serve as faculty uh, among the training programs. We had a list in the presentation that showed all the faculty and, and their academic representation. Submitted in the document packet that you have all the slides, so it's available for your reference. It, it's it's a pretty. So you could speak to it rather than going through this um, the stack that's taller than I am. <laughs> so, thank you, uh, Dr. Hawkins. I know you had a question for Dr. Fleming. It was answered. Okay. Are there any? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Yip. Two question and a comment. Um, for this slide, what percent of applicants fail the uh, fellowship application? 
or certification. The, the percentage of passing varies. It's normally uh, in the uh, th that pass, approximately se high 70s to low 80s. Uh, um, we've had uh, as high as uh, upper 80s pass, but the the that's a result of the examination and the validation by our psychometric consultant establishing a appropriate gut score for the exam. Thank you. The question, Dr. Framing. How long does it take for you to review all the document and join this report? Um, at some point, you stop counting. Um, I, I'm not sure when I was initially contacted, so it's been over the course of the last two months. Um, all told, probably in the probably in the 40 to 80 hour range because I mean there's three volumes of stuff that you read through once for exposure and two or three more times for comprehension to understand the context poke around the website so yeah probably in the 40 to 80 hour range or so I honestly did not keep track Dr. Krauss oh I'm sorry the, the, the reason I asked and make comment that this Professor spends so much time review this for the board to make a decision. I don't think we have time for that. I I was personally see that it was sort of task force to study both sides in order to make a decision. That's my own personal. Opinion. Dr. Krauss, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the medical board has granted board equivalency to four non-ACGMA boards historically. And I'd like to know if we have criteria for, for granting that status, or were those approvals done in a similar fashion to what we're doing today? The criteria that the board has to go through is the regulations, which is set forth um, in 16 CCR 1363.5. And it's, uh, there's several requirements that have to be met. Uh, the one at issue here today is uh, subdivision B8 regarding the training requirements. And so is there a criteria? Yes. And the other requirements, um, like a, has been stated today, they're uh, pretty basic to go through. Are they nonprofit? Yes. Do they have at least 100 members across the states? Yes. Um, it's the training period or, and, and training um, requirements that we need expert reviewer for, and that's the, the holdup. So what it comes down to that I'm hearing today is there's still a difference of opinion whether or not the training requirements are equivalent. And is there any other matter which is standing between the ABCS and, and are saying that there's board equivalency, or is it just the training at this point? It's the training at this point. Thank you. Dr. Levine? Um, are there any board certified plastic surgeons who subsequently apply for a fellowship in cosmetic surgery? Yes, we have had uh, several board certified plastic surgeons that have applied to the fellowship, completed it successfully, and are duly board certified. And um, I know the requirement is at least 100, but what is the total number of fellows that you have successfully trained? I don't know the number specifically, but approximately 80% of our members are fellowship trained at this point. 80% of what's the total? We have We have 374 members.
she's part I, of it. I think she's a presenter. We she is a have presenter. other presenters up here, so I think she should have a microphone to speak. There are two members of the ABCS um, uh, listing in California who are certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. One, uh, Dr. Ormond, uh, says that he has no knowledge that he is still a member. He hasn't paid dues for over a dozen years, but he's still listed on their website. Uh, Dr. Kivett um, is no longer practicing plastic surgery. He is working as a medical director for a medical spa um, but is a, a member of their organization. So um, there are some plastic surgeons who have been involved with this organization. Our concern, uh, moreover, is the, is the uh, in their presentation that they gave to you, they talk about the fact that their members have no more disciplinary actions than plastic surgeons, and that is not true. Um, our perusal of the medical board website showed that 24% of their members have had disciplinary actions compared to less than 4% of American Board of, of CSPS members um, who have had disciplinary actions. That's going and, beyond the, the question, so I you. do want to respect that. Uh, uh, I'd like to comment on that. Dr. Ordon that she mentioned was a featured speaker at the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery just three years ago. He very well knows that he's certified by the ABS, as he mentioned it during his speech uh, at the academy. And in regards to the reprimands, if you allow me, I will show you that the reprimands are the same. We have them printed, and we have them on boards. We can show you all of the reprimands. They're public knowledge, and the reprimands are significant. Some of those people are still practicing. You look up Kenneth Benjamin Hughes, still board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery, still has his license has killed three people, one fat embolism, 10 bowel perforations, another one where I'm an embolist, and he has two other patients that have been really, really sick. The guy is still practicing. The reprimands that we have are no way in comparison to what they have. And this is not a battle between plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. We are not here to say that we are equivalent to you guys. We are not here to compare ourselves to you guys. We are here to say that we are ABMS equivalent and we just want to have honest communication with our patients. We want to be able to say that we have taken an exam that has tested us for our skills and our training, and we have passed that exam just like any other ABMS board. We mirror that process to the T. There is no difference. Recognizing our board is not going to detract from your practice. Recognizing our board is going to do public safety. Is, is beyond the, the topic. She went beyond. I'm so sorry. I have to, to respond. I'm so sorry. I apologize. I, yeah, you, you responded. Thank you. Are there any additional? Uh, Dr. Ganavade? There's nothing uh, to do with uh, either of these boards, but I just want to remind the board members that this will be the last time we'll be looking at any boards for equivalency because we are off that business. As of our last uh, Sunset Board, we gave up that we gave up accrediting medical schools, uh, foreign international schools, we gave up PTA letters, so we didn't want to be in a business of doing things which we're not experts at. Um, Dr. Bollard? Yeah, I just have a simple question, I think, but what's the why for the California health consumer, given your small numbers right now, what, what is your why for the health, California health consumer? getting this certification? It, it's simply to allow honest communication and for patient safety. As we mentioned, cosmetic surgery has, has really exploded in the last 20, 30 years. It has become a vast field that is practiced by many specialties. Many, many of them are not trained <coughs> on IOTA. They will take a weekend course and perform a surgical procedure, which is completely inappropriate. We want to distinguish ourselves from people like that. We want to be able to communicate to our patients that we have gone through specific training in this field, we have passed an examination, we are certified by a board that is reputable, and we are for patient safety. Not being able to communicate that is, is inappropriate. It's actually against patient safety. It doesn't make sense. Thank you. 
Are there any additional comments? Oh, Dr. Levine. This is a question for our attorney. Um, is there a difference under the law in um, saying, um, let's see, certified by the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery versus board certified in cosmetic surgery? Are those two things the same or are they different? As, and the reason I ask the question is currently the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery certifies through this process that you have described to us um, individuals who've completed a fellowship training. Um, could those individuals under our current truth in advertising state that they are certified by the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery? The way I look at Business and Professions Code 651H, it's they cannot claim to be certified, board certified or certified by a board uh, unless the board meets, there's three pathways. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. I have a question for Dr. Fleming. Um, Dr. Fleming, based on what you've heard today, is there anything you want to add, say, or make a statement? Uh, other than I don't have any skin in this game? <laughs> um, no, yes. I, I mean, I think from, from my perspective, I think the, 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 the sticking point for me is that despite the the fellowship program training guidelines that are, are solid is I honestly cannot find convincing evidence that they are truly adhered to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I don't have that outcome piece of information that gives me the assurance that what is said to be done is actually being done, and that mm -hmm. is where I just got stuck. Okay, thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Fleming to visit our fellowship. That will give him a better uh, perspective on making that decision. It is hard to make that type of a decision when you're reviewing a website. Well, well, uh, the, my, my, uh, my it's, it's, it's not a test of my internet searching skills. I mean. What I was left with was an application packet that, that didn't have that, and so, so I was I'm just I was looking to find some reassurance, and that's that's where I struggled, and that's where I just I just couldn't do it, and that's. May, the may point. I ask you a question? You said that you have been involved in ACGME residency evaluations and fellowship trainings. When you evaluate those programs, do you go visit those programs, or you just re review paperwork? The the ACGME review process is, has changed and, and it is my involvement with ACGME review has been as, as the site that is being reviewed and the interactions that is um, um, a part of the, the site reviewers. The process now is, as, as you know, has, has changed fundamentally and is much more dependent upon internal reviews, self-evaluations and, 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 and a large volume of, of um, internal reviews and assessments um, that are that are now presented for reviews and so the, the actual on-site visits have, have plummeted to being a, a relatively infrequent and and that's that equivalent data that I just simply couldn't find for these programs thank you you have an open invitation regardless dr. yep just for dr. kind of the uh, uh, comment about uh, this is the last chance we have this. So does it mean if we do not have a decision today and our next point meeting is January, that what would happen then? Did they have to go through another process to get so-called um, certified? The law after January 1st, basically the law for the board to um, deem a facility as equivalent goes away. So on December 31st, that law expires and is eliminated. 
Dr. Gonanade? Yeah, that, that was actually our wish. We put that in the <laughs> sunset along with several other things I mentioned because there were certain things we did not have the expertise, including uh, certifying international medical schools or uh, saying somebody ABM is equivalent. So this board put that in there, so that's why I just wanted to make sure the board knew what, the, what, what it is. Dr. Levine? So were this, so I, I guess my question would be, um, subsequent to, to December 31st, um, what would be the recourse for the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery? What would they, would they have? It depends on what the decision is here today. As, um, it, assuming we weren't doing this today. It, it, they would not be able in California to show that they are board certified and there would be no decision on this application whether it was um, approved or denied basically at that point. So in perpetuity there would be no ability unless the law changed to advertise as board certified. And there's, there's other boards out there that you know want to go through this process and basically as of December 31st that ability is no longer in the law. Can I ask a, a follow on question? Um, th that hasn't been addressed, which um, it relates to the coattail slide that we saw. Um, were this to be granted by the board, how would the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery deal with the fellows who achieve fellowship status, certification status, through pathways that are no longer available? What would happen? Yeah. I'd be uh, happy to address that. Um, no board strips their diplomats of certificates. There is um, uh, prior evidence of this um, through uh, other boards and organizations. Uh, however, in the prior presentation, the slide was very misleading with confusing information related to those who are eligible to take American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery fellowships versus become board certified by this organization either now or historically. I would like to add to that. I, I don't think that completed the answer for the question. The, the people that are experienced throughout through the ABCS, the slide was confusing the academy with the board. The people that were examined by the board and have gotten the certificate through the experience route, what he said, are going to retain their certificate because at the time they took the exam, those were the criteria and they met the criteria. The criteria were very stringent even at that time. They had to present over a thousand cases. Now, this is the same in every specialty. For example, just recently, addiction medicine or emergency medicine. There are people that are teaching emergency medicine who have gotten that board certification through experience, not through a residency in emergency medicine. It, does it detract from their experience or their knowledge? <coughs> no, it doesn't. They can practice emergency medicine. Not only they practice, they are residency directors of emergency medicine. It is no different with our board. And those are the minority of our board members. Dr. Krauss? I must say I'm puzzled. Um, we, we have a, a well-respected academic authority who has been retained by us to analyze the situation, who has told us he finds no evidence for training equivalency that wouldn't support our saying that there should be board equivalency, and a very well-respected board member has said that in part this authority which was invested in us by the legislature is now removed because we're not certain that we have the ability to make this determination. So it, so it puzzles me as to why we're making this determination today. I don't know that I'm going to be any more smart or stupid on January 1st. Um, so, so I'm in a position, unless you know, something strikes me before the vote is taken, I'm in a position where, where morally I feel obliged to abstain on voting on this issue if I don't have confidence that the board is the right 
authority to, uh, to grant this privilege? It's not really a question. It's, it's just a, a sharing of my puzzlement. Dr. Yip? That's my frustration. Um, they have done a lot to come to this part. If we say abstain, no, means pretty much like that's it. On the other hand, we don't have any authority past January. I mean, if we have, I would consider make a motion to have a task force really look into it and get the work done within the next month and come back to the board for that. But uh, if we don't seem to have the expertise to even make that decision, then I, I don't know how we're going to move on. So <laughs> if we're going to vote today, I mean, you know, abstain from it. So. But I think they have done a lot that I think they deserve our attention and, and, and more more work to, to, to bring it in, into fruition. Do any other members have any comments? Dr. Bolat? I, I support Dr. Yip's concept that, and, and Dr. Krause's as well. Today, I couldn't make a decision and I would need to abstain because I heard it, I've listened to it, and yet at the same time, because in, I must say publicly that it bothers me a bit that this board <laughs> is deemed to not have the ability to understand uh, residency and fellowship training. But um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would, I'm, I'm, I am in the same quandary as my colleagues. I'll go, please. Dr. Lewis. Okay. It's, to me, it's like a clock. I, I, on one hand, okay, no, I don't think it's equivalent. Then all of a sudden, I think it's equivalent, and I'm in the same quandary. I don't feel that I am ad have adequate information right now to make a decision. I, I want another year to kind of like massage all this, and we don't have it. I mean, I could make a motion just to put it out there, but because we're going to have to do something, you know, some some vote. But I am the same same boat. I'm just I'm. I've never been this puzzled by and struggling over a vote as I have with this. Well, if I may respond, Doctor, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this statute still has more life. Uh, we've contributed as much, and by the way, this statute, uh, to go to Dr. Krause's comment and inquiry earlier, it's rather anomalous, and it's a function of a nationwide campaign that has been somewhat successful, so-so successful. This is a process that's anomalous to California. In a, uh, it, it, when you ask, what do other states do? Mm -hmm. They do nothing, unless they have a comparable statute. Mm -hmm. And the statute is driven by interests that want to restrain physician advertising. And with respect to counsel, reread 651. In quotes, the only term is board certified. The statute says that the use of the term, quote, board certified, close quote, in reference to that certification I'm sorry, is but what's at issue. The board is also required to do regulations. Correct. And that, that's a piece of this as, as well. It's a piece of the law, and, and, and that restricts it. And it's a matter of history and, and uh, the underpinning. But the, the fact of the matter is, Dr. Lewis, we would welcome a motion because it's inconsistent for the members of the board, as Dr. Bullad has pointed out, to suggest that today in 2018, the board lacks the same capability that it possessed in the 90s and in the early 2000s in approving four other boards. It grappled with the circumstance. It heard the evidence, and it concluded on equivalency. And, and the expertise is comparable on this board as it was in each of those phases. And there's considerable difference in this de novo application than the history. Ironically, the last application, since it was invoked, was criticized for supporting multiple certification pathways with one qualification pathway. As Peter Canelia has pointed out, that has been distilled so that one eligibility pathway supports one criteria, and the reviewer contends contradictorily that it may support too broad an engagement in the practice of medicine. It, 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 my head is spinning from that inconsistency. 
we would encourage you to act. Uh, and if not today, there's the opportunity for the board to compel additional information and meet by whatever means and vote by whatever it means it uh, has at its disposal prior to 12-31-18. So just to let the members know what their options are really at this point. So you, you have the evidence that is in front of you. You have your medical consultant's review and what he has said and it doesn't seem that he has changed his opinion today from what was written in the report. You have heard evidence from um, ABCS, you've heard opposition from it. As of today, you can make a, you could um, make a motion to um, approve the application of ABCS. You can make a motion to deny the application of ABCS, or you can move to request additional information and there would be a in need for an interim board meeting before now and December 31st. However, I let you know that if you want additional information, we would need specific information as to what we would be going back and requesting because we would need to have um, clear cut definition of what additional information we would need in order to bring it back to you to make a decision, um, something that you believe that you're missing in the determination. If you can't make the decision, as I'm hearing from members, I would need to know what additional information you would need in order to make that decision. Those are really your only three options at this point. Yeah, I mean, you can't really table this decision because it, it would need to be made prior to the December 31st date. Since we have the information, it's not that we don't have, we, we don't have an incomplete application. We have all the evidence in front of us. Okay. Dr. Yip? Before I make a motion to uh, suggested board to get a task force to review and look into this in depth. I asked my board member what kind of information that you would like to bring back to make a decision before the interim board meeting. Like we hear about the curriculum that we don't look into more carefully. We want to look at the statistic. Um, what, uh, as as Kim said, we need to specify what information we need. So if if the board member here can tell me what we need, I can make a motion along that line to have a uh, task force look into that and then bring it back to the interim board meeting. Dr. Krause? Oh, sorry. I, I really don't think that that will be fruitful. Uh, a lot of time and effort has been spent by a lot of people and simply we're, we're placed in a position of having to determine whether or not there is training equivalency that should allow us to grant board equivalency. Uh, and I have no faith that I'm going to make a better decision a month from now than, than I could make today, but I have no faith that I'm going to make a good decision today. Uh, Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, uh, Dr. Yip, I, I don't think we need any additional inf information. Our struggle is uh, because it is their last chance and we have expert opinion, we heard both sides, we got to make a decision today. If there are no other comments, I'm going to ask for a motion. Oh, there's no, yeah, we can, no, we can have ask a motion for public first. comments afterwards. I'll put the motion out there to deny the application of the American Board of I'd like to make a motion to deny the application of the American Board of uh, Cosmetic Surgeons. Can I get a second? We have a second. Okay, so due to the large number of people who would like to comment on this agenda item, we invite you to come forward. I have um, lots of slips here. Um, please state your name, organization, your position, and I'd like you to, to keep your comments short um, because we also have comments that are going to be on the phone. So, if you all could um, please step, uh, move back from the table, please. Thank you. Um, Maurice Sherman.
Good afternoon. I am a uh, cosmetic surgeon, facial plastic surgeon, uh, who has been in practice for 35 plus years. I have also have unique capability of being able to contrast the amount of competency of plastic surgeons versus cosmetic surgeons in my job as a medical director for the past 10 years at a large plastic surgery uh, company where we have three clinics in California. And it is my personal opinion in taking care of patients and having to uh, correct problems associated with surgical results that we have had much more problems with board certified plastic surgeons, not only in fresh out of their residency uh, and fellowship programs, but also plastic surgeons who have been in practice for 20 to 30 years who have come in and worked at our clinics. Compared to cosmetic surgeons, board certified and board eligible cosmetic surgeons who we also employ. Competency, unfortunately, is not bestowed upon board certification. Competency is something that is learned primarily through, exper through experience and through exposure. And to that end, I think the proof and the discussions have already been uh, open towards how much more experienced cosmetic surgeons who have gone through their fellowship program have in relationship to plastic surgeons. And this has been also documented in the plastic surgery literature. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael Swartz. Thank you, uh, distinguished members of the board. My name is Michael Schwartz. I'm a practicing cosmetic surgeon in Pasadena. I am certified by the American Boards of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery, which is an ABMS board, the American Board of Facial Plastic Surgery, which is one of the four equivalent boards, and the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. I have been serving as an expert reviewer for this medical board for over three years. Um, I have been asked to review primarily cosmetic surgery related cases, and I'm currently reviewing the 14th case. Um, I have, uh, there is, there is um, an unfortunate irony in that, although I am able to review cases for the medical board, which are cosmetic surgery cases, uh, I am able to testify in court as a representative of this medical board in uh, pertaining to cosmetic surgery cases. Uh, yet, I am not able to uh, inform my patients or the public that I am a, quote, board-certified cosmetic surgeon. I hope you will not respond to this by kicking me off the expert reviewer panel because I appreciate that work and I find it very valuable. Um, I would respectfully request that uh, you approve this petition and deny the motion uh, made by Dr. Lewis uh, as I believe we have shown that we meet and exceed the standards uh, set forth uh, by the board. And I would hope that you would find in our favor. Thank you very much. Um, Babek Onlimoki. I may have said that wrong. I apologize. That's okay. How are you? Good afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Babek Onlimoki. I'm a general surgeon, first and double uh, fellowship trained in bariatric surgery, minimal invasive surgery, and also uh, cosmetic surgery. I was in practice for 10 years doing uh, bariatric surgery and minimal invasive surgery in Maryland. Then I moved over here, before I moved over here, because I was doing a lot of uh, bariatric surgery, I had many patients that needed body contouring afterwards. And these patients had a very difficult time finding correct uh, plastic surgeons could do their cases at affordable prices. And I felt I could provide something in my practice that was unique. I didn't want to go out there and start doing uh, tummy tucks and body lifts without adequate training. So I went and I did additional year of uh, fellowship in American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery. Uh, when I first went to their meeting, uh, as a general surgeon, I was very biased. I looked at uh, the group as a group that uh, they had no business be doing uh, plastic surgery. But uh, when I went to the meetings and went and saw their fellowship training, I realized, wow, their group is truly 
organized, they teach well, they mentor well, which is amazing. In our residencies currently, there's a lack of many of these things. You go to a training and uh, because of uh, concerns with medical uh, malpractice, because of concerns of many things, a lot of surgeons end up training without adequate amount of being able to do the procedure. The example that we saw on the board of, uh, yeah, the surgeon, uh, the fellow doesn't do any kind of work, is uh, probably not uncommon when you look at it. A lot of fellowship trainings have become uh, a place where people just, uh, just watch the surgery and they don't do the training which is kind of sad. But most of the trainings that I've seen in cosmetic surgery, they have been hands-on. Very rigorous, very hands-on. And, uh, and uh, the issue with uh, educational components is also very strong. And uh, I'm here to testify on behalf of somebody who initially was biased and after seeing the training program, I uh, changed and I uh, did my fellowship training. I sat for the boards. And for the first time I sat on the boards, uh, the examination, I didn't pass the exam because I wasn't sure uh, I didn't prepare well. I had to sit again and take the board examination again, and I passed it. And then I did the oral boards, and I passed it. And I'm here to testify as somebody who's gone through the system and uh, to express uh, and show that uh, this is a legitimate board with people and training and mentorship uh, that is on par to any other board. As a general surgeon, the uh, general surgery board is nothing compared to the American Cosmetic Surgery Board. It was much more difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Norton. Hello. I have prepared comments that are two minutes. I'd like to thank the members of the board for allowing me to explain why I have chosen to pursue a fellowship in cosmetic surgery. My name is Dr. Laura Norton, and I'm a board-certified general surgeon, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons, and a fellowship-trained breast surgeon. I enjoyed a dedicated breast surgery practice in Northern California for the last seven years. I've worked alongside gifted and extremely talented plastic surgeons my entire career, performing mastectomy and reconstruction operations. Many women with breast cancer, however, don't need and don't want a mastectomy. Oncoplastic breast surgery is a new and exciting field in the U.S. At its most basic level, oncoplastic breast surgery challenges breast surgeons to perform more cosmetically pleasing lumpectomies without sacrificing oncologic safety. Training in oncoplastics is limited to breast fellowships and courses. Over the years, I've expanded the techniques that I learned in my breast fellowship by taking every oncoplastic course available in the United States. Despite this, I felt that there were many patients that without, that I couldn't meet the needs due to the specific operation I felt that they needed without formal training in breast reduction and mastopexy techniques. I considered taking more courses for those specific operations. A surgeon can take a breast reduction course or a mastopexy course. But at the end of the day, I desired more fully submersed training that one only receives in a fellowship. What you can't get in a course is taking care of actual patients. There are excellent courses. Um, many of the best ones include a cadaver lab. But it doesn't give you experience with actual patients, with their preoperative evaluation and postoperative care. When I decided I wanted to do a fellowship, I evaluated both plastic and cosmetic surgery fellowships. When I compared these, I realized the exposure to the cosmetic breast procedures was greater in the cosmetic fellowships. I started my cosmetic surgery fellowship three months ago and I've been extremely pleased with my training experience. I'm excited I will be able to translate my new skills in breast reduction and mastopexy to my patients with breast cancer, therefore expanding the number of patients that I can offer to save their breasts. I'm disappointed to learn, however, that my efforts to go above and beyond in my training will not be recognized by the Medical Board of California. 
I urge the board to keep an open mind in recognizing the unique subspecialty of cosmetic surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Whitney Florin. Hi everyone, my name is Whitney Florin. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, um, and then I completed a fellowship through the um, ABCS. I'd like to kind of follow up on some of the things that Dr. Norton said. You know, cosmetic surgery really is such a unique field. I think the fellowships through ABCS really perfectly train us in that field. We're in private practice. That's where most patients go for cosmetic or elective surgery. I think it's unfair to compare the plastic surgery residency, which is a residency training, of course it's academic setting, of course it's in a hospital, to a post-residency fellowship in cosmetic surgery. Um, today I think sadly has sort of been a plastic surgery versus cosmetic surgery conversation, which is not what it's about. Um, as Dr. Hayavi said, you know, we're not trying to advertise as being the same as plastic surgeons. We are not. Cosmetic surgery is very different than plastic surgery. And it's just a small section of what plastic surgery entails. Um, so I hope you all really can look at the clear evidence that's been given to you that shows that the ABCS fellowships do meet that criteria. Um, I hope that you're not clouded by Dr. Fleming's ambivalence over what he researched. Um, to me, it's very surprising that he did look at this evidence and says it's all there, but I don't know if I believe that that occurs in the fellowships. Um, with all due respect to him, I, I don't understand how an expert opinion can look at that evidence and say, I don't know if they really do that. To me, that's not an expert opinion. That's, you know, an opinion. Um, I think things would be very different if he did spend time going to fellowships and seeing what the setting was and seeing whether that curriculum really was met, which, of course, it is. Um, I, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Josie Wilder. Hello, my name is Josie Wilder. I'm here as a consumer because I recently had a breast lift and implants done by a board certified plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills and my outcome was terrible and below the standard of care. As you can see in the before and after photos that you have access to in the booklet provided. When I voiced my concerns about what I looked like after the healing process, my doctor was very aggressive and rude to me. I was made to believe that I was just being picky and that this awful looking result was my fault. I felt, ashamed that, I felt ashamed of myself that my body had healed that way. As a consumer, I have been conditioned to finding such a doctor simply by looking for the term board certified. After my surgery, I was so scared to undergo another, but my health was at risk and I was embarrassed of my body. I started to tell my friends of my experience and was finally referred to another doctor specializing in cosmetic surgery to fix my previously botched breasts. Only then did I find out the different degrees of experience certain titles hold. How is it that the surgeon who was able to properly fix my surgery, who possesses extensive training with board certification and clearly the, a better choice for me, hidden from us and not allowed to claim board certified, despite the fact that he is capable and qualified. More importantly, how can a consumer like me or any other patient differentiate between board certified cosmetic surgeons and non-certified surgeons if the doctor is not allowed to say it? It's very backwards and confusing and it feels unfair to every potential patient to be operated on for say breast surgery when quite possibly they've done far more in the area of liposuction. How are we supposed to choose safely? I feel the representation of these certifications are non-consumer friendly. We, we as consumers deserve to know exactly whose hands we are placing our bodies and our health. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tatiana Weplo. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Tatiana, and I'm a patient as well. Eleven years ago, I went to a board-certified plastic surgeon to have several 
excuse me, to have several procedures done. At that time, I did not know what is the difference between plastic surgeon and cosmetic surgeon. Had I known, I would have preferred to use a board-certified cosmetic surgeon. I have done several procedures since, and I only use board-certified cosmetic surgeons. The problem is, it is difficult to distinguish who is board-certified and who is not, since California do not, does not allow them to advertise their certification. When I had my procedures 11 years ago, I contracted Pseudomonas bacteria from the doctor's operating room. Since plastic surgeons mainly use hospital operating room and cosmetic surgeons use their own surgical centers, it was obvious that my previous surgeon It was obvious that my previous surgeon did not know how to pers personally sterilize his environment for cosmetic surgery. My infection started showing up three days after surgery. I did get immediate in treatment, but then months later, they came back. I went back to the surgeon. I, he had no idea how to treat it and even denied it was an infection. I was recommended to a cosmetic surgeon in the area. Since all he did was a cosmetic surgery, he recognized immediately it was some kind of infection from my previous surgery. He sent me to an infection disease specialist in the area who did a culture and confirmed that Pseudomonas was back and never went away. I went through several months of treatments, including having a peak line. Every time it seems it go away, it just came back. The doctors came to the conclusion it has to be surgically removed. I went to local cosmetic surgeon to do it, even though my insurance wouldn't cover it, so that I would not have awful scarring. When he opened me up, he found a mesh across my entire abdomen. One that was never been, one was not even approved for this type of usage. The mesh was entirely infected and had to be removed. Several months later, I started getting more postules. This time, the, the cosmetic surgeon removed all previous stitches. They were also infected, and my implants sterilized in the area and put one's new ones back. Over the course to, to two years, I spent countless days in the hospital with intravenous antibiotics, went through a total of three surgeries, and spent over 50K out of pocket. Please conclude. Excuse me? Please conclude. Your, th you've, your three minutes have passed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Then I cannot continue. No? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Worrell Kalui. Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Cooley. I'm a, a general surgeon, board certified, board sur uh, general surgeon, uh, and fellow of the American College of Surgeon. I'm fellowship trained in bariatric surgery, been practicing for 15 years, and recently got trained by the uh, uh, American Board of Cosmetic Surgery and got the boards from them. Uh, I have one of the uh, busiest uh, bariatric practices in San Diego and taking care of the weight loss patients. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the plastic surgeons refuse to take care of the weight loss patients, giving them um, reasons of not being healthy and not be able to take care of them. I do take care of those patients. I'm really puzzled as well, like you guys, and especially because of your expert opinion that I think it was biased. I went to one of the highest programs in training in general surgery, bariatric surgery, and there's no difference than any of those programs than the one that I went to train with the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery. Uh, his opinion is totally biased, all respect to him, but 40 to 80 hours of search 
to make a decision on our future as an organization and for you to take a decision on it today. I hire close to 20 people in my practice. If I'm not going to be able to continue to do what I'm doing, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick Hermes. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I am not a French billionaire. It's pronounced Hermes. I wish <laughs> okay. I was an Hermes, but uh, I am the Director of Government Affairs for the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, and I just wanted to touch on one component of this that has not been discussed as much as um, I certainly would have hoped, and that is the, the program oversight aspect. Um, the, Dr. Fleming talked about how there's no verifiable data and outcomes on program requirement adherence in the, the AACS fellowship programs. And um, if, you, if you look at the structure that the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgery has to um, review its programs, the concerns associated with that program requirement <laughs> adherence grow even more. Um, the fellowship re review committee that reviews the actual fellowship programs is um, dominated by current program directors. Um, based on our, our look at it, nine of the ten members of the committee are, are current program directors, um, which creates, you know, at least the, the incentive to be more lax than would be ideal in, in verifying that these things are happening. Um, the, the previous comment that the medical board um, is not qualified to make these evaluations, you know, I, I'm not going to disagree with your opinion, but w what I would say is I, I think you're all fully qualified to look at these things, you're just not resourced to do it. And with these non-independently accredited programs, you really do need to go into each one of them and see how they're operating, or you need to be able to look at the oversight structure in place and see that it's adequate enough to ensure that program requirements, requirements are being adhered to. And you can look at the structure that the ACGME uses, working with institutions and um, you know in, institution oversights, uh, graduate medical educa education committees within the individual academic programs, the oversight is, is vigorous and there's really um, absolute certainty that, that these program requirements are being hit or if they're not, it's being addressed. W what I would say in closing is there's, there's variability in the quality of individual surgeons, there's variability in the quality of individual ACGME programs. Just like there is with AACS programs, I have no doubt that Dr. Hivey's program is wonderful, and if you went and looked at it, it would probably be exemplary. But there are, you know, 25, 27, 31, however many of these there are, and the question is, is the consistency in the floor of, of the diplomat that they're producing sufficient to protect the public safety? Thank you. Tim Madden? Thank you. Uh, Tim Madden, I'm here representing the California Society of Plastic Surgeons, and I know we've heard a lot, and I'll keep my comments brief, but just to remind the board, the decision at hand relates to physicians advertising the use of the term board certified, and that, that's really it. There have been some comments from some individuals saying that if they are not allowed to do that, they will go out of business, but there is nothing that stopped them from talking about the very training that they're discussing right here. And they do do that on their websites, and they still are in business. So I was just, my only point of coming up was to remind the board that the decision is fairly narrow. It's limited to advertising the use of the term board certified. It doesn't stop them from doing these procedures. It doesn't stop them from talking about their training. It simply limits the use of that term, um, which in our view should be protected as it reflects a um, higher level of training. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments on the phone? Any comments on the phone? Yes, we do have a comment. Susan Lauren from Public. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, I was a licensed um, deep tissue massage therapist and movement teacher for 25 years. I formed a group called Lipo Coalition to educate about the danger and long-term harm of liposuction. I am against this um, proposal. The reason is the public is already at risk because of board-certified plastic surgeons who are doing procedures who, that make people sick or dead. They modify their reviews, slander, and threaten 
harmed patients, cover up assaults with gag clauses, and stage corrupt trials. And so far, the medical board hasn't been helpful with my situation. I was disabled, disfigured, and left in unrelenting pain by an experienced board-certified plastic surgeon in California. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain, which is why I sound this way. I'm not nervous at all. Um, I found um, in six years of being connecting with other people, there are tons of people in California and in this country who are harmed by these board-certified plastic surgeons. Um, I don't... I don't think it's a good idea to add more to the mix. Liposuction is part of medically, many medically recommended and cosmetic procedures. Animal and human researchers have, researchers have proved that fat removal causes increase in visceral fat and disease processes, and cells grow in undesirable ways, and I promise you that. Chris Centeno, MD, says you haven't seen invasive until you've seen a liposuction. The Clinical Anesthesiology Journal says a quarter century after the nation's plastic surgeons received what amounted to cart launched to perform liposuction, a new analysis suggests the procedure is no safer than it was back then. Making matters worse, the surgery has been oversimplified in the popular media. Throw into the mix an ample supply of seemingly unscrupulous physicians and state regulators, that's you, who do not appear ready to crack down on them, and the result is a recipe for nas national disaster. The American Society of Anesthesiologists said, California's liposuction regulations do not prevent patient deaths. And the regulations specify a requirement by volume of fat removed. These are too high. Patients die with even lower volumes. And by the way, if they don't die, they may be living like I am in a living hell. The Health Advisory Technology Committee said death and disfigurement due to liposuction should be a matter for serious public concern. The increasing number of liposuction procedures has led to a growing number of iatrogenic fat tissue deformities in addition to those of traumatic and disease-related nature. Since liposuction is a pay-out-of-pocket procedure, data is not collected as to how many procedures are performed, the complexity of procedures, or results of complications. Clear important statistics are withheld from surgery-owned uh, surgeon -owned surgery centers. Uh, plastic surgeons and their boards mislead the public with liposuction propaganda, coerced through false imagery, strong advertising, and deceptive short-term results. There is no science behind what they do. They pinch and guess. Now, I propose that liposuction and body sculpting ads are banned, and California Let's Liposuction conclude. Code 1356.6 removes the mention of... Paul, you've reached three minutes. Please conclude. Okay, I will. Thank you. And replace it with uh, anatomical suitability must be proved. We must hold the medical board accountable to track down, crack down on unscrupulous cosmetic and board-certified surgeons, including those that work for them, like the one who lied in my trial. And I don't think that we need to add more. The cosmetic surgeons, although I, I heard these people speak, and I, uh, I hear that they... Ms. Lauren, your time is up. I, I wish the best for them, but let's stop harming people. That's it. Stop it. Thank you. Are there any other comments on the phone? The next comment is coming from Doug Free, California Society of Plastic Surgeons. Your line is open. Thank you very much. My name is Doug Free. I'm a health care attorney in San Francisco calling on behalf of the California Society of Plastic Surgeons. I've been involved with this issue for many years, and in brief, I'll just note my opinion and belief that Dr. Fleming reached the right conclusion in finding that the training is not equivalent. It's my feeling and, and belief that the average consumer accords great weight to the term as board certified, and that if physicians who are don't have the requisite training are allowed to advertise using that term, I believe that significant harm will be, be uh, endured by the public for many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any additional comments on the phone? Yes. Steve Teitelbaum, UCLA. Your line is open. Hello, my name is Steve Teitelbaum. I'm an associate clinical professor at UCLA. I was involved back in 2005 and understand this very well. So for those of you on the medical board who are having trouble with this decision, let me help you. This law, this regulation that you have to vote on, is whether their training is equivalent in scope, content, and duration for a matter of public safety to a related ABMS board. And now I'll give you the reasons why the scope, the scope, content, and duration is not safe as compared to an ABMS board. Number one, it is only one year long. There is no one year ABMS specialty. Number, number two, until 
a couple of years ago, 2014, they had something called an experience track where you could become a member just by submitting a case list and not taking any training. If you approve them today, you are approving a lot of doctors who never had any of that training at all. The medical boards, the reviewers, and two appeals courts in 1997 and in 2005 both rejected their application. So if you accept their application today, are you saying that they erred in 1997 and 2005 and that you are overturning them? I doubt that. What you would be saying is that you believe at some point things changed since 2005. If you're going to do that, you have to kind of pick, well, in what year did they become equivalent? Because you would be approving all those who got in at a time when your predecessors on the medical board saw that they were not equivalent. The next issue is the medical board violations. 25% of them have significant board violations compared to less than 4% across the board and ours. It's disrespecting the medical board and it's good judgment for one out of four to have had uh, charges of uh, gross negligence. Furthermore, they continue to advertise, as Deb Johnson had shown you. How could you possibly approve a group who's throwing in your face who is flouting the law they were turned down for in 2005. That's amazing to me that someone could be violating today when they're on their knees asking you to pass for them. So I think it's very clear for these, oh, one more reason. Their requirements only require assisting in surgery. Every ABMS board requires, in order for a resident to count the case, that they do a significant part of the case, that they do all of the important aspects of the case. And this change was made because assisting doesn't teach you enough. So they list tremendous case numbers, but they're just in the room watching. There is no guarantee. There is no guarantee that they are doing a significant part of the case. And the last thing now is the definition of fellowship. Fellowship is their own word. Fellowships have never led to board certification. Your time is up. Fellowships are a year of additional honing of experience in an area in which... Caller, you have reached three minutes. Catherine, please place the caller back in the queue. Are there any additional comments on the phone? Are there any additional comments on the phone? additional comments at this time. Okay. Ms. Cruz-Jones, please perform the roll call for vote. Can I just ask a clarifying question? Oh, Dr. Levine? I just need, I wanted to ask a clarifying question in case anybody knows the answer. Is it true that a one-year fellowship has never led to um, certification, board certification? Is that accurate? I'm getting two answers here, correct and incorrect. Uh, I'm sorry. I no. That's Dr. Levine, Dr. Levine, I can answer that. I, so there are some one-year fellowships which lead to board certification. Uh, trauma is one. It's changing to two. Uh, vascular surgery was one. It changed to two. So the many fellowships are going to two years now, but there were one-year fellowships which, knee, which, uh, which got into certification before. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones? Restate the motion. Uh, to deny the application for equivalency. It was to deny the application of American Board Cosmetic Surgeons. Deny. Dr. Bolat? Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. 
Dr. Krause. Abstain. Dr. Levine. Abstain. Dr. Lewis. Abstain. Mr. Warmoth. Aye. Ms. Wright. Dr. Yip. Abstain. Ms. Pines. Aye. Motion fails. We have five yeses and five abstains. Okay. Does it fail? Yes, equal? We have to have a we have, Yeah, we have to have. So what we'll This do. is under 2013. We have to have an affirmative vote of a majority of those members present. Okay, so where do we go next? Uh, my is there another motion for those who abstain? Or is it just that you don't have enough information or we just, we don't feel the clarity has been provided? To not for this level of what is being asked for. There's competing statements on certification. There are competing statements on equivalency and whether it works and whether it's not. So to, to make a decision in a vacuum in an hour, it, it, that's- In a couple it's, hours. It's, it's, it, it, it's not, it's not gonna work. Can I, so. Yes, Dr. Lewis. Um, I agree with Ms. Wright, even though I made the motion to get it out there. But um, in all difference to Dr. Fleming, who spent a lot of time, I don't feel I'm still getting enough information for this level of discussion. So, and you know, you were struggling, at least I heard also. So I, I'm not there. Dr. Yip. Yes. Technically, what does it mean when, like, it's tied? Does it mean the application is not moving forward? Does it mean right. as as good as like a no, right? Right. At this point, it wouldn't it wouldn't move forward. It, it it's not approved. So that means the matter is dead, correct? Unless someone makes another motion. And, right. And we're going to end up the same way. <laughs> it's going to end up the same way. So, so do we need to do an interim meeting? Um, I, I think I would need a, a motion on the table to ask for more information, and then that information needs to be clearly identified I, to the board. Um, okay, Jamie, Ms. Wright? I will make the motion that the informal meeting, more information is given to the board so that we can make a proper decision. And we would need to know what it, that information is. And what that information is. Uh, no, I need it from you guys. You, you need to know. say what the information I mean, well, is. Well, that's for, the problem. For me, for me there was um, the, uh, the gentlemen, they mostly have all left, um, but there were at least three times where uh, he said, we don't have it online. So to Dr. Fleming's, what Dr. Fleming was looking for, there was a number of times where the gentleman who was sitting here, I can't recall his name, um, said we have it, but it wasn't online. Um, so if he can remember those things that he said that you have and weren't online, that would be the information that we would need. We'd be happy to provide it. Uh, and again, apologies from the members who have had to leave. Tomorrow is the first day of board certification in Dallas. And we appreciate the board scheduling, and you, you may as a board know that staff accommodated our request to have the hearing today mm -hmm. so that they could be available in Dallas for their national uh, board testing. Prep is tomorrow, and testing is applied Saturday and Sunday. With regard to the question, we'd be happy to meet and confer with Dr. Fleming immediately and okay. provide exactly what, uh, frankly, we think your expert should specify for you to help uh, members like Ms. Wright and others identify, since we have the affirmative obligation to put up the requisite information 
If there's something lacking or if there's something he failed to identify or couldn't acquire, it's our obligation to provide it to him. We'd be happy to do that. Okay, Dr. Fleming. <laughs> You're on the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> please come and come to the mic. Come up please. to the microphone. Is there a second on the table? Second. Okay. I am any. I'm willing to help you in any way that you desire. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah. So, so one of the things Dr. Fleming said was, point uh, or stated was the absence of evidence of the extent to which the individual fellowship sites um, actually uh, operated according to the, the principles that I think we all agreed were, were created and established to demonstrate equivalency after the last um, 2005. So from my perspective, the absence of evidence is not the same thing as evidence of absence. And, and I would, what I would, what would be helpful to me is to the extent to which you can provide evidence that in fact the fellowship, the individual fellowships, the 27, um, actually abide by the, the criteria. And the, and the one thing I, I, the one thing that's sort of sticking in my mind was this issue of the surgeon who says the fellow will only be watching and not actually performing it and he's here three days a week, every other week. I mean, things like that kind of are like, are like red flags. So the extent to which you can put to bed concerns about the extent to which um, the individual fellowships, the sites of fellowship, the, how, they are, how they are reviewed and how the reviewers ascertain that um, these individual programs are actually following their own rules. There are a lot of ways to secret shop. I might have called and just said I'm Joe Smith and secret shop rather than the anonymized uh, email. But setting that aside, we'd be happy to provide that hard evidence. And frankly, within close proximity to Dr. Fleming's physical location, we can expose him personally to that, as well as give him whatever documentation he identifies. Be happy to do that. And it isn't about picking an ideal program. <laughs> You know, the, I mean, yeah. again, it's you got tw 27 sites. How do you ensure the consistency among the sites? We would be happy to throw them all in the mix and without any warning uh, to have the uh, reviewer appear. I can't do all 27. But. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Dr. Krauss. Uh, if we do meet again on this issue this year, I think the other thing that needs to be resolved is in relation to what was asserted that the ABCS today is bigger, heftier, and more rigorous than the ABCS of 15 or 20 years ago in relation to Dr. Teitelbaum's concern that if we grant board equivalency today, that that grandfathers every ABCS uh, board certified person rolling back to 1979, mm -hmm. do we need to consider that the board certification goes back to 2014 or 2012 or just goes forward from today's date. Uh, I think that's an important thing to consider. It's certainly a threshold issue for us, but as you heard testified during the course of the Mr. hearing. Mr. Valencia, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off okay. because I think that we need to go back as staff and talk about this and this isn't the place to continue comment on it. Certainly. Okay. Ms. Cruz Jones, let's take a vote on that we are going to have an interim meeting to discuss the ABCS's application for equivalency. Dr. Bolat. Aye. Dr. Ganadev. No. Dr. Hawkins. No. Dr. Krause. Dr. Levine. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Warmoth. No. Ms. Wright. Yes. Dr. Yip. Aye. Ms. Pines. No.
Motion fails. So I think it, the we don't count the abstain in the situation. So we have one, two, three, four. It's five. Five. five but it, oh, it's no, one abstain still tied. Two abstain. What is it? Five eyes, four no, one a abstain. So just the tie, right? Two abstain. It's a majority of the board. With the abstention, though, it, it's we would count those who voted, and it would be it would pass. So the motion, I'm sorry, the motion passes because the abstention actually removes that individual and so five is a majority of nine. I just wanted clarification. Okay, so we will have an interim meeting. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you everyone for your comments. We appreciate it. Moving to the next item, which is item eight, the executive management report, Ms. Kirschmeyer. I will try to keep this um, very short. So please find the executive management reports under agenda item eight. There are a few items I would just like to bring to the board's attention. Um, as stated at the last board meeting, the board is still unable to obtain any budget detail due to the Department of Consumer Affairs switching over to a new accounting database. That database is called FISCAL and those reports haven't been able to be gotten out of that database. We are uncertain as to when these reports will be received, but until those reports are received, we're unable to provide any information on the board's expenditures in our normal packet and the way we usually do. We do know that the board's final outstanding loan has been repaid um, of $9 million, and so that means that we no longer have any outstanding loans to the general fund. Um, however, with the board's current budget and the revenue that we've been receiving, um, I want to let members know that there may be a need to seek a fee increase in the next year. As you can see in fiscal year 1920, the board is expected to be at 2.2 months reserve and then at 0.1 in fiscal year 20 and 21, which means that we would be um, basically unable to continue to move forward. The board staff will be closely watching the budget this year to determine if a need for any fee increase is necessary. And again, this last year um, we did expend our entire budget, which means that um, we'll have to watch it this year and see what that looks like and if we do expend it all. For the last two months, the board has been working diligently to answer questions about CARES, and I will be giving a presentation in a moment on that. But I would just like to thank um, Carrie Webb, Christine Lally, and Mary Kate Cruz Jones for all of their help on these calls and emails. Based upon the questions, the board has actually released an FAQ that is on the board's website and it was emailed out to all physicians and sent through the subscribers list. Um, it's actually a really good document. Really encourage all of the members to go out and get that document um, and, and use it in your um, practices. We will be adding questions to those FAQs as they arise. And we've also been doing a lot of presentations on the implementation of that mandatory use law and then also several webinars that have been going out. So I'm hoping that members were able to attend those webinars. We will continue to do these presentations and if any of the members would actually like uh, such a presentation at their facility, please let me know because I can get the Department of Justice to come out with this and we can come out and do a presentation at your facility. Then earlier in this week, as Ms. Pine stated, we did attend the Administrators in Medicine workshop held in Sacramento. Um, this organization is made up of all executive directors across the nation. And as Ms. Pine stated, she and I provided those presentations yesterday. And a lot of information sharing happened at the meeting and we discussed best practices and ways to continue to share information. And due to the lateness of the meeting, that concludes my report. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Um, I do. So when we were at the AIM conference, there were, you know, sort of a lot of uh, differences and comparisons amongst the different boards that were represented. 
Um, and I wanted to see something around the iOS came up, Kim, and I wanted to see if you could talk about what the difference between us, California, and other boards as it relates to IOSs, which are the interim suspension orders. I think we, 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 I think we constantly need to hear more about that because I know that's a challenge with um, some of the cases that come up sure. before the so, board. So it's interesting, actually, as we get together sometimes with these other organizations, a lot of times their enforcement is just very different, actually, because their enforcement sometimes involves the board members at an earlier stage. But one thing that is kind of evident is how different in California we are than other states when it comes to um, that initial suspension orders. So for example, in other states, the actually the executive director, the executive officer in those other states can actually in, issue like a temporary suspension order in a lot of those states. Um, other states, maybe it might not be the executive officer, but it actually is sometimes the mm -hmm. um, board uh, or a, a subcommittee of the board that can enter that issue, that ish, interim suspension order, or they call it emergency suspension order in those states. And they also don't have any time delay on the, or time requirements on the end. So California, one thing that makes it difficult for us is first of all, we have to petition to an administrative law judge to get that um, interim suspension order. And then the second thing that we run up against is we actually have to file an accusation within 30 days of that interim suspension, suspension order being issued or we lose the interim suspension order. So it goes away after those 30 days. So basically, in order for us to go get an interim suspension order, we have to be ready with our investigation completely almost through so we can have the evidence to file that accusation. And I know Gloria would back me up on that because um, it's something that we run into all the time. In addition, they don't have any requirements for hearings. And for us, not only do we have to file that accusation in 30 days, we also have to be able to go to hearing as soon as that doctor requests um, a hearing. And we have to go to hearing in 30 days after that doctor requests it. So as far as interim suspension orders, that did come up and that is a big difference that we have than the other states. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions or comments from members? Dr. Hawkins? Just to like to get clarity at some point about the vote how the, on the prior issue. It, how the vote is determined, what's uh, uh, Yes or no, meaning fails or, or because initially five five was fail. fail. I, don't go back to the I just want to understand like how the voting works. Look, it sounded like there were two different ways. Of I I have the same issue too because you had five yes, zero no, and five abstention, and you said that failed. Yeah. Then you have. How many yes and how many no's and one abstain? So you, you, with the first vote, you had the same number of people abstaining as voting. And so they're, they're you didn't have even um, a majority of the members casting a vote. So in the second one, you had nine members casting a vote and the majority passed the motion. Right. The first one was the abstentions went yeah, your mic. away. Your mic. The abstentions, it says here, um, uh, are not counted. They just go away. Those people were removed, mm -hmm. correct? So the voting, so the five... If you That's remove, then you have five zero. That's why I'm just curious how this this thing is just because one no. There, there makes wasn't a, a majority of the members voting. Right, it's the majority that overrules everything. Abstention is a term in election when a participant's vote is either no or yes, but it's not. But it's like not casting a ballot in a way. Right. It's it's odd with Robert's rules. So, Dr. Ganadev, does it answer? Dr. Hawkins, do you, Jeannie Mark? So the first time around, we didn't have a majority of the members actually voting because you had five abstains. The second time around, you actually had nine members voting, five for it, four against it, and then one abstention. So you had a majority of them actually voting. 
the abstention does not affect the voting result. Okay. Are there any other Got questions it. from members? Um, we have a slip here for number eight, Eric Andrus. Oh, okay. Is Christine on here? No, no Christine is, isn't on here. Is she tomorrow? Okay, for tomorrow. <laughs> um, are there any comments in the audience? Any additional? Any comments on the phone? Okay, great. Moving to, wait, I didn't hear from the phone. Okay. Um, moving to next item, which is item nine, discussion and consideration of committees and task force. Ms. Kirschmeyer, could you please provide some background on this agenda item? Absolutely. Um, so please turn to uh, agenda item nine in your packet. Um, as the members may remember, the prior strategic plan required the board to review the committees, task forces, and subcommittees every two years. While we have a new strategic plan that doesn't include this requirement, we believe it is still prudent to review the committees every two years to ensure that the committees are still warranted and to determine if any new committees or task forces need to be initiated. On pages BRD 9-1 to 9-4 is a list of all of the committees, task forces, subcommittees, and a council. Upon review, a staff's review of all of the information in this document, we do not believe that any committees need to be eliminated or have their responsibilities change. The board committees meet on an as-needed basis and all of them have a distinct purpose. However, one item I would like to bring to the board's attention from reviewing it is the makeup of the board's executive committee. A few years ago, a change was made in the way the membership of this committee was determined to be the board's officers, the past president, and the chair of each standing committee. However, depending on who sits in these positions, it may cause the ratio of physician to public member to not provide adequate representation. No additional public members can actually be added to the committee because it has already has seven members. Therefore, I believe the board should revisit this membership makeup, and with that, I actually open it up to the board for any questions, comments, or discussions. Okay, if there's no comments, um, thank you, Ms. Kirschmeyer, appreciate that. As Ms. Kirschmeyer stated, based upon the ratio of physicians to public members on the executive committee, committee, it would be my recommendation to change the makeup of this committee. Instead of the chairs of the standing committees, I am recommending that the committee be made up of officers of the board, the past president, and two to three members appointed by the board president, as it used to be in the past. This will allow the committee to be adjusted for the purposes of ensuring a better ratio of physicians to public members. I will also be revisiting the enforcement committee membership to ensure a better ratio of physician and public members. Finally, in addition to current task forces, I am adding a stem cell task force and a compounding task force. I would like to appoint Dr. Kraus and Dr. Hawkins onto the stem cell task force, and Dr. Gananadev and Dr. Yip to the compounding task force. Both of these are emerging issues where the board members need to work with staff in obtaining information and holding interested party meetings on these topics. If any board members have an interest in serving on a committee, please let me or Ms. Kirschmeyer know by the end of this year. However, I will be making some changes for the next year, which will report, be reported at our next board meeting. Can I have a motion to change the makeup of the executive committee as discussed? Second. Okay. Are there any questions or comments from members? Dr. Gananadev? Yeah, Ms. Pines, I think we did the same last year about the executive committee, which was important to have public members. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Krause? therapy yes thank you okay are there any comments from those in the audience any comments from those on the phone no comments from the phone at this time okay miss Cruz Jones can we have a vote dr. Bolat 
Aye. Dr. Ganadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Krause? Yes. Dr. Levine? Yes. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Warmoth? Aye. Ms. R Ms. Wright? Yes. Dr. Yip? Aye. Ms. Pines? Aye. Moving on to agenda item 10, presentation and update on control substance utilization review and evaluation, known as CURES, including a registration, mandatory usage, and outreach information. Ms. Kirschmeyer. Okay, I'll try to make this as quick as possible. It is kind of a longer presentation, but if you have questions, um, please feel free to stop me as I go along. So as most of you know, CARE stands for the Controlled Substance Utilization Review and Evaluation System. Um, this CARES database, it includes information basically from schedules two to four controlled substances um, prescriptions that are actually dispensed to patients as reported by those dispensers. So the law actually requires that dispensers enter this information into the CARES system within seven days of dispensing the drug. Some of you may remember that there was a bill going through the legislature to change that to one day. Unfortunately, that bill actually did not make it through the process last year, but I believe that that'll be another thing that comes up in the next year. So some important dates to talk about CARES. First of all, and this is kind of even still as much outreach as we did, but it's interesting how every day we continue to get a call from a doctor who says, I didn't know I need to register, but as of July 1st, 2016, required it reg registration in the CARES system for all California licensed prescribers and dispensers. I would like to point out one thing that we keep getting calls for is I don't write prescriptions, so do I have to be in it? If you are licensed, your license is in an active status, and you have a DEA that authorizes you to do two to four, you have to be registered in the system. That's what the law requires. Even if you're out of state and you hold that, you still have to be licensed in CARES. Then in October of um, 2018, um, CARES integration became available. So that was where it's mixing, that was AB40, where you could use your electronic health records, and now they're gonna be able to be, have CARES integrated into the health information technology system. So that's going on um, October 1st. And then on October 2nd, it came in the mandatory use of CARES prior to prescribing. I'll describe that a little bit more. But before I get to that, I would like to just do a quick, quick run through on the CARES system um, just to kind of go over what, what you have to do. So this is actually the CARES registration. This actually provides a web-based electronic registration. After you actually put your information in on this page, um, you uh, really limited information here at this point. You're just basically choosing um, your role. You're going to basically be a prescriber if you're a physician. And you put in your email address. You say that you're not a, a robot and you click on it and it will send you an email then that sends you into the registration process. So this is what the CARES registration form looks like. Um, the physician enters all of their necessary information. They complete the required security questions and my recommendation is you write those security questions down because that comes back around and you need to be able to answer those questions if you have a question with Department of Justice to provide them that information. One, in, one item that continues to come up as well is that it's very important for physicians to enter the information exactly as the board has it. So don't enter your I-10 number in there if you gave the board your social security number, and most ever, all doctors gave us their social security number. So make sure you use that number. Make sure you use your correct date of birth. I know that sounds funny, but that's another thing we've been running into um, from physicians. And then your license information. It's gonna ask you if you're AC or G and then put your license number in. If doctors are having any trouble with this, um, it's important that you contact, you can contact the Department of Justice first. They may then send you to the medical board because what we're finding is that social security numbers, um, either the applicant provided a dispose, you know, a number that was um, out of order when they applied, applied to us, just wrote it down wrong, or uh, some of the individuals who entered the information may have fat fingered the information. So we've been going through all of those and working with the doctors to make sure that they're able to register. So that's some of the things we're seeing. This is what the CARES dashboard, after you log in, you get all registered and you log in, this is what it looks like. 
As you can see here, this also has right on the front tab the alerts over here. So I'll go over this in just a minute, but this is really important. It shows the alerts. Then down here, it's going to show you any prescriber messages. And this part down here, the bulletins, is actually where it's going to actually provide information that DOJ may want you to know. So in this um, instance, they had wanted you to know that its certification happened back in April of the system that then moved us to the October date six months after for the mandatory use. So this is something we've had questions on. This is really important, and this was one of the biggest benefits of the CARE system. So the CARE system actually, back on that page I showed you the alerts, if you have a patient that fits into any of these categories, this information actually goes onto your dashboard. So the first one is any of the prescription recipients who are currently pres being prescribed more than 90 MMEs per day, any individual who has obtained prescriptions from six or more prescribers or six or more pharmacies during the last six months, recipients who are currently prescribed more than 40 um, milligrams of methadone daily, recipients who are currently prescribed opioids more than 90 consecutive days, and then opioid, um, those who are currently prescribed both benzos and opioids. So if any of your patients fit into that criteria, it's going to pop up into your alerts on the dashboard. And it is every day it comes back, so you, you'll be able to see it over and over again, basically. So patient safety alerts, this is when they come in. You can actually search them. Um, once it shows up on that, you click that little detailed day information. It comes up into this. If you want to then run your patient activity reports to see what exactly is coming out of there, you want to select this and then run the PAR stands for patient activity report, and it'll give you that patient's um, information. So the global um, navigation bar, this actually gives a lot of information. So at the top of the, it's at the top of the dashboard. And basically your user account, um, it's going to allow you to update your profile, your manager your delegates, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Change your password, all of that's right there on that website. Um, it actually lists, lists here your searches. So if your delegate has done any search for you in the CARE system, that will pop into there. And then the CARE system, it, what's nice about it is also allows you to do saved searches. So if you have a patient that you know is going to continue to come back, you run their patient activity report, do it as a saved search, and then it will come up in that drop down. It also, this is where you're going to go to run those patient activity reports to generate the report. And again, those come up in either PDF or Excel. And then the prescription form um, theft or loss, it allows you to create a report and then also do a self-search report. So delegates, to me, this word has caused the most confusion of anything pretty much in this mandatory CARES usage. And I see Dr. Balat shaking her head because I think she's been running into the same thing as well. I'm going to go through this slide and then I'm going to describe this a little bit more. So first of all, any prescriber and dispenser may register a delegate to assist them with CARES. Uh, the de delegate may initiate the, the patient activity report search on behalf of the prescriber or dispenser. And a um, prescriber can have up to 50 delegates and delegates can support up to 50 physicians. The delegate, truly all they can do log into the system, enter the patient's information, and push run. The, the report will not go to them. The report goes to the doctor. It goes to the prescriber, the individual who they're a delegate for, and it comes up on his dashboard that I showed you earlier. Then it is the responsibility of that physician who's doing the prescribing to pull that CARES report in the database and review it in the database. That's how we have... Um, um, reviewed the law and that's Carrie and I that's how we're implementing the law and how we've re reviewed it and determined that that's um, the, I'm, I'm looking for a word um, that's how we've defined it anyway and that's how we're holding uh, individuals to it so this is how you actually run a patient activity report. Um, it's easy. You just put in the search criteria, the patient results come up, and then you're going to find each of those patient details from that report that you've put in. The search criteria asks for all of the information, last name, um, date of birth. That's one of your most imp important information in there. Searches may be made on partial match or exact match to be inputted in the information. And then a time period of uh, 12 months from the date of search or a date range of up to one year can be searched. So it's up to you to put those date ranges in there. Um, 
just so you know, you, you may have more than one patient, more than one search pop up for the patient, because if it comes up and, and it was uh, an individual, it's, you know, Sally Smith, and the date of birth is the same, but the addresses are different, it's going to show two different searches, so you have to make sure you're paying attention to that, and you want to run a patient activity report on both of those individuals, because it truly is the same person. So once the um, search results come in, the patient records come up, you get this screen here where it displays the patient in a pick list below the search criteria. And then you're going to push this select button to choose which one you're going to run. So here you can see you click, you will click on that select um, tab, and then you go to generate report. Once you generate that report, it's going to give you that patient detail, details. Um, and then you can choose whether you want to download the patient activity report or whether you want to print the report. Um, and I think I have, yeah, here's where you can actually choose that information, whether you want to download it or whether you just want to print the information. The download goes into Excel database. This is what the report actually looks like. Um, you can see here it has all of the information, um, the, the um, patient's name, all of the information of the address, what they were prescribed, the form, the quantity, all of that information, including the pharmacy name and the prescriber's name, all comes up on that patient activity report. So the patient activity report has all of this information on it, obviously date filled, date sold, drug name, all of the information. The ones with the asterisk, those actually are only if you download it into the Excel database. Otherwise, that won't show up on your patient activity report if you just print it. So compact and messaging. This was another thing that came up actually um, as a bonus to the Cures 2.0 system. Um, it actually allows you to put in if you have a pain management contract with or a compact, they call it, with a patient or if another doctor has one, you'd be able to see it there as well. So the compacts, those are, I named them as pain agreements. That's what we kind of see them as. They called them compacts. Um, the prescriber can actually notate patients with whom they have treatment exclusive, exclusivity agreements to forewarn other patients. And then the other benefit of it is the peer-to-peer -peer communication that is allowed. So the a prescriber can actually put in their contact information and you can, um, prescribers and dispensers can securely send messages to prescribers concerning mutual patients within cures. It is done completely in the care system. It doesn't go out of the care system. So it is secure if you're sending those messages through the system. It doesn't hit another email. It's right there in the system. So the, again, this is the searches that come up. These are the delegate searches, the safe searches, and then once you click on those, it comes up with the, if your delegate ran it, that would show up here. Or if you had a save search, you want to go back and search Sally Smith again, you can actually click on it there, and, and it'll pop up into your, um, your box there. Okay, so the real issue. What is mandatory use requirement from um, Senate Bill 482? So with specified exceptions, the prescriber can, 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 shall consult the CARES database no earlier than 24 hours or the previous business day. And just that previous business day, that's if you run it on a, um, you have the patient coming in on Monday, 24 hours would be Saturday. You don't have to run it on Saturday you could, or um, Sunday it would be. You could have run it on Friday because that's the prior business day. Anyway, um, so they have to do that before prescribing a Schedule 2 to 4 controlled substance to the patient for the first time and at least every four months thereafter if the substance remains part of the treatment for that patient. And then in the law, it specifically defines first time. It talks about the initial occurrence in which a healthcare practitioner in his or her role as a healthcare practitioner intends to prescribe, order, administer, or furnish the Schedule 2 to 4 controlled substance to the patient and has not previously prescribed a controlled substance to the patient. And in our interpretation, um, that first time really comes into effect after that October 2nd date when it became required. That's how we implement all legislation, so that's what we're saying. Um, Any time after that first time of October 2nd, you have to look it up, and then thereafter that first time would go away, but you do have to do it every four months thereafter. So obviously it became effective on October 2nd, 2018. So these are the exemptions that are specifically outlined in the law. 
And so the first one is if the controlled substance is administered while the patient is admitted to or during an emergency transfer between a facility as specified in law, if the controlled substance is prescribed, ordered, or administered in the emergency department of a general acute care hospital and the quantity does not exceed a non-refillable seven-day supply. If the controlled substance is prescribed, ordered, or administered to a patient as part of the patient's treatment for a surgical procedure in a facility as specified by law, and that quantity, again, does not exceed a non-refillable five-day supply. The next one is if the controlled substance is prescribed, ordered, or administered to a patient receiving hospice care as specified by law. In any time where we talk about as specified by law, in our, on our website, you can actually go in there, you can click on there, and it'll take you to this relevant sections of law. And for the hospice care, it does have to be one that is set up by the specific health and safety code um, section that is listed in that section. Um, and then the exemption, um, this is the last one, if, the, um, if it is not reas reasonably possible, so there's three criteria you have to meet on this, if it is not reasonably possible for a physician to access the information in the CARES database in a timely manner, if another physician who can access CARES is not reasonably available and the quantity of the controlled substance does not exceed a non-refillable five-day supply of the controlled substance. And this is the only one that requires documentation, okay? The others don't require documentation, but this one in the law, you do have to document this in the um, patient's record if you are not um, checking cares because of this exemption. Yes. Kim, on the previous slide, yeah. the hospice, uh, the patient receiving hospice care, does that mean palliative care? Does it does not. It means hospice care, and it's defined in um, section... Uh, hold on just a second, Dr. Levine. So it says, if the healthcare practitioner prescribes, orders, administers, or furnishes to a patient currently receiving hospice care as defined in section 1339.40, so they have to be registered in the hospice system. Okay? All right. Okay, so this again is the only one that requires documentation. Um, if the CARES database is not operational according to DOJ, and these are the technical, more technical exemptions, um, if it cannot be ac accessed due to technological or electrical failure or technological limitation, um, if the cons consultation, and this is the last one, kind of the catch-all, if the consultation of CARES would result in a patient's inability to obtain a prescription in a timely manner, it will impact the patient's medical condition and the quantity does not exceed a non-refillable five-day supply. So a lot of questions that have been coming into the board is what are you going to do if you find out that we did not check the care system? So the one thing that we're talking about is citation and fine. This would be um, one of the items that we could do. Unfortunately, though, right now, our citation and fine regulations do not actually cover this requirement. Um, so we will be looking. There's several items that we need to actually update our citation and fine regulations, and this will be one of them that individuals will be able to issue a citation for this specific um, violation. Uh, it can also be added as a cause of action in an accusation requesting disciplinary action. So I, I see this, it hasn't come yet, but I see this as an issue where we're investigating a physician and we determine that they are inappropriately prescribing. And one of the other things that we identify is they didn't check cares prior to prescribing. That could be added as a cause of action in that, act in that disciplinary action um, in the accusation. And these are the different types of disciplinary action that could be taken on that accusation, as you all know. So these are some of the common questions that we get up, and I just wanted to go over a couple of them with you. Um, so the requirements, what do I have to do? Um, first of all, a lot of doctors think that it's every time that they write a prescription. No, it's not. It's just that first time and then every four months if that um, controlled substance remains part of the treatment. Documentation is another one that we get a lot of. And so this one, they want to know, how do I document that I checked CARES in the record? Or how do I document that I had an exemption and I didn't have to check CARES in the record? There is no requirement for documentation with the exception of that one exemption that I showed you. 
However, what we're telling doctors is we are recommending that you do document it in the chart, whether you just put a note in the record that says, I checked CARES, or whether, excuse me, whether you just put a note in there that you had an exemption and you didn't check CARES and why, what that exemption was. Or you can also, if you are checking CARES, print out that CARES report and put it in the patient's record. However, again, that's a recommendation. It's not a requirement. Auditing, again, how are we going to audit this? This is, keeps coming up. The medical board right now does not have the ability um, to be able to go in and identify um, whether we every doctor has checked it. We could. We could ask DOJ to run a report. However, the problem is I have no idea unless I investigated every single time it wasn't checked to know whether was it the first time the person saw it, Did the, was there an exemption, However, if we're investigating the matter, we will be looking into this and auditing the record, and the board does have the ability through working with DOJ to identify whether the doctor checked cares prior to prescribing, and that is something that will be part of our investigations going forward. Consulting at discharge, this was one kind of a shocker, I think, to most of us as we started looking through the exemptions. And what it is, is if you are a patient and, I mean, if you have a patient that is admitted to, admitted to one of those facilities and that drug is being administered to them while they're in those facilities by law, you don't have to check. There's the exemption for CARES. However, at discharge, unless it is a surgical procedure, you have to check CARES. So if you have a patient that went in, they got admitted, they're in the hospital a couple days, and you're going to write a schedule two to four at discharge, you have to check the CARES database, okay? It was a little bit surprising when we looked at it, but that's the way it is. So we get this from a lot of the hospitalists that are asking questions. Hey, do I have to check it at discharge? Yes, you do, unless it's that part of that surgical procedure. One of the big questions we get is the difference is, if I go in to have a baby during, you know, for natural childbirth, or if I end up having a C-section, is that then a surgical procedure? Yes, it is then a surgical <laughs> procedure, okay? Um, delegates, we get that question a lot. Who can do it? Um, the, the big delegate question that we get is, can that person run it for me and give me a printout of it? No, if they're a delegate, first of all, most delegates are usually your MAs. They don't have access to the CARES, the patient activity report. All they can do is run it, and it goes into your, um, into your inbox. They can't actually print it out. And again, what we we're telling physicians, because they said, well, I've given them access to my account. That's illegal. You can't give out your password to anyone. Please keep your password to yourself. Don't give it to your MA. So who has to check CARES? This is the other question we get a lot of. So um, the question is usually, I am the, um, I'm not the primary care, I'm just the attending physician for this individual, or um, I'm filling in for the primary care um, because he's on vacation. Do I have to check CARES because the primary care has already checked CARES? Yes. The law says if you are writing that prescription, and this is the first time for you for that patient, or it's been four, past four months and that patient's getting it, you have to check the care system. Um, you can't rely on the other doctor because you are writing that prescription. Um, facility exemptions, one of the big things is, is my facility exempt? That's what they want to know. The, and a lot of people believe that just because they're working in X, X facility that they're exempted. That's not true. You need to fit the other requirement, which says that the patient has to be admitted to that facility, or you ha it has to be a surgical procedure in those facilities. There is no really just one facility that's exempted. Um, covering physicians, I already went over that. If you, they're covering for another individual, you have to, um, <coughs> excuse me, you have to check cares if that's your first time of doing it or uh, over the four months. What do I do with the information? <coughs> so I've pulled a patient activity report. Now what do I do? You need to follow the standard of care. In some instances, that may mean that you need to refer the individual to treatment. Um, it may mean that you need to look at the prescribing that you're doing to this individual because maybe they're getting it from other words. But what we're telling individuals, you have to follow the standard of care. And then the last thing that we see is I'm not practicing or I'm at a state physician. Um, do I have to check cares? You have to check CARES if you meet the criteria. So if you're doing telemedicine, <coughs> oh, 
and you're prescribing for an individual and you have a California license and you have a DEA that allows you to do two to fours, you're going to have to check CARES before prescribing that. Usually it'll be a three or four um, controlled substance. So we have done as much as we can really to put out information on our website. So our website, we developed a complete Just Cures website and it has all of this mandatory use information, it has registration information, talks about direct dispensing. This is where we put our FAQs on there. It has some tutorials from the Department of Justice and a lot more information there on our, our Cures website. This is the flyer that we put together for individuals. Um, it's on our website. Recommend that everybody goes and prints it out. This is really the best information. I actually like to use it from our, directly from our website because then the links are live and you can use them to find out what facility it is. And then these are our FAQs. So this is the compilation and it's out on our website. And these are, were taken from true questions that we received from individuals. Um, and, you know, these have been looked at by legal. We've done everything we can to put as much information out there um, for individuals. <coughs> and with that, um, any questions? Thank you, Ms. Kirschmeyer. Are there, Dr. Kraus? Perhaps I slept through it. <laughs> um, but did you, did you comment on the ultimate integration of this with EHR system? Yes, so I talked about it in the, the first um, couple of slides when we were talking about important dates. It happened on October 1st. AB 40 said that the Department of Justice by October had to be able to integrate and they have, my understanding, I just got an email earlier this week or last week, stated that they do have it ready to start integrating with healthcare systems. One thing, and this is, this is coming, it keeps coming up, um, one thing is you can't have another individual print out your, the cures and give it to you to review. The, the law specifically says that you have to consult the database. However, with CARES integration into the EHR, if you're going directly in, it's going to show, it's going to provide an audit trail. Department of Justice made sure that if I log into my EHR and there's, and I'm not sure how they're going to be set up. I'm assuming it's going to be different because there's all the vendors, you know, Epic and whoever else we have out there. Um, but once you get into there, if there's a CARES button and you click on the CARES, it should pop right up into your electronic health records. Um, that then pops back to tell DOJ that that doctor has logged in, he was logged in under his name, and it checked the CARES system for him. So yes, that's supposed to be available. It, there is going to be a charge to the facilities to set it up, but it's really up to the facility to contact DOJ and sign that MOU with them. Dr. Yip? Does the State um, Board of Pharmacy have a guideline as far as how soon after the prescription that the patients refuse the prescription? Let's say I uh, write local October 1, the patient did not pick up the medicine until October 7th. Is it a red flag to the pharmacy to call the doctor or is there any, any guideline out there? The reason I ask, I know some yeah. doctor, they, for the sake of convening that in the, in the clinic, already write all the prescriptions. So when patients go to surgery, they don't have to go back to CVS and get the medicine. But um, I just wonder what is the timeline that the pharmacy would say, hey, if more than that, we call a doctor. Is it, is it, is it a prescription? I don't have the answer for that. I don't know how long the pharmacy will hold on to that prescription or when they call the doctor to say, hey, your patient hasn't picked them up. I don't know if any other doctors on here. I know, I know for cures, it will not go into the system until it's been dispensed. So it does have to be when that patient picks it up and then they have the seven days to enter it from the picking it up or the dispensing it, putting it out there. That's the only time frame I know of seven days. I don't know that. Anybody know if a pharmacy will pick up the phone and call them? I don't know. I think it's more arbitrary. Right now we do get call from pharmacy. If, if my prescription not feel like more than three weeks, they would call me. Did you did you write the really? prescription? They they write for, if you need pain medicine, you uh -huh. need it now, not like three weeks later. So, yeah, doctor. I, I believe that the practice is established by the pharmacy. Some pharmacies okay. will just return to stock mm -hmm. a prescription that isn't picked up within three weeks or four weeks or something like that, some will call the physician. All right, and, and uh, Ginny, uh, the Board of Pharmacy is gonna have a representative at our January meeting, so that might be a question you wanna ask them if that's, if it's a requirement or if it's just how the pharmacy practices. Dr. Gananadev? <clears throat> yeah, Kim, I think every good thing uh, turns into bureaucratic thing. So, um, so I, 
uh, my ER doctors are complaining that there are some usual people, now they're coming more often because they can only get pain medication. They don't ever go see the primary care doc, and they're coming. So I, my other one is that uh, why should it cost to integrate into EHR? I mean, it, it, we're trying to help the patients, right, and also help the doctors. So added charge just creates more, more, uh, more problems. So I'm not sure what DOJ you would have to ask the legislature that because the legislature, I believe, in the bill actually allowed them to charge a fee for the integration. Look at Ms. Smoes, I believe so. Uh, it was actually in the original bill, or in AB 40, that they can charge a fee. I'm not sure Carrie's looking at her book. But. Uh, and uh, I think that what you presented actually should be somehow or other more, more popularized or presented to a lot of primary care docs. Mm -hmm. That's where I think we have, uh, we do because they are on a time limit, how long they can spend the patient, time with the patients. We are adding another one, and when you refuse or when you deny a pain medication prescription, that will last about three times the way I visit. And I mean, I've been hearing from Forget about the established docs, hearing from my third year family medicine residents. That's what is taking forever to convince them. Then there is a complaint about those docs because they did not give the medication. So we got a lot of issues we need to look into. Unfortunately, cures is not with the medical board, it's with the DOJ. That's another issue. And were they complaining about the time frame, Dr. Ganadip? No, it's see, there is a customer satisfaction okay. survey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every doctor now, yeah. now nowadays gets, uh, I think permanent medical group does better than anybody else on that one, but, <laughs> but there are so many residents, when they hear about cures, they look through the cures and then, then starts Okay, you don't need this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to go through addiction medicine specialist and so on. So some patients listen, some patients get angry because they were given this all along for the past two or three years. Got it. Mm -hmm. Suddenly this young doctor who is still a third year resident or a young attending doing all this. So it's, it's an issue. Yeah, but it, at least it's... Looks like it could be solving the problem of maybe that individual being over medicated. Yeah, Dr. Hawkins. Uh, just a quick question. I'm, I'm not having any of my pharmacies, but are the pharmacists uh, who are being asked to do more and more complaining? Are they putting the data in because they have to put the data in first to be able to retrieve it? No, that's been a requirement forever um, that they have, well, not forever, but since CARES was initiated, the pharmacists have to enter that information into the system. So really, this, the um, AB 482, they were, pharmacists were exempted from this. They don't have to check CARES um, and veter veterinarians, which I don't know if that will change in the future, but for right now, those two, two groups were exempted. Dr. Bolat? Yeah, just really quick question. Was there a time, and does anybody remember that you couldn't the cures document in the paper medical record? Yes. Okay. That came up, and there was a bill that passed just this last year that says you can actually put it into the medical record. That's great. Record. I, I, and, and the other things, you can give it to your patient now. That was the other thing. I that think was, that Those were the up. two things, right? Jennifer. Yeah. Those okay. two things. Thank you. And then this year, the bill passed, I believe. Jennifer will talk about it tomorrow. Do one of Dr. Yip's big issues is that a prescriber can run a activity report on themselves. So that'll be a big help to doctors, too, to see if their prescription pad's been stolen or anything. Wow. Yeah. Are there any additional questions? Uh, Dr. Gananadev? No, it's dinner time. But uh, when does it become actually uh, live means that as it happens rather than time delay in between when it is entered, when it comes to you? So it's never going to be um, completely online I, that I know of, but most, most pharmacies right now are entering it within a day. Um, but it will still, even if you enter it in the cares, it has to go back east to a vendor back there that kind of scrubs the data and clears it up and then puts it back. I think it's A A I E something like that anyway, and then puts it in. So the law um, that tried to get it to require it in one day or one business day, that didn't pass this last year. But I know it will come up again in this next year for legislation. 
Any additional questions from members? Um, I have a slip here from Eric Andrus. Just real quick, oh, is it on? Okay. Real quick, uh, kudos to my friend and fellow advocate Bob Pack for bringing cures to where it is today. Real quick question, if a doctor prescribes the medication during the surgery in anticipation of sending it home with them at discharge, does that change that? So that they don't have to look it up? So in uh, the, the surgical procedure, what we're ha we've had a lot of doctors ask, um, can I prescribe the, um, can I provide the prescription ahead of time? Because in surgery, that's what they do. They prescribe it ahead of time, and then um, the, doc the patient feels ahead of the surgical procedure. That is exempt, according to it, because it is still part of the surgical procedure. So then they wouldn't have to look it they up in cures. To. Okay. Yeah. And just real quick, wouldn't it be great if Breeze worked as well as cures and patients could look up information on doctors as well as doctors can look up patients' information? Thank you. Um, Tim Madden. Thank you. Tim Madden, and I'm here on behalf of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And um, our comments are consistent with what Dr. Krauss had brought up around electronic health records. So in the emergency department, we're really excited about the notion of having integration with EHRs. And the example that, that we're running into is patient comes in in the emergency department. At the point that they're registering with the hospital, the hospital EHR system will then query cures on behalf of the physician. So now the cures information will get into the medical record. So our folks, before they even go in to see the patient, they'll already have it. So in that situation, it really helps them in terms of um, addressing any potential problems with the patient. If they are a drug seeker or they're there for some other reason, they'll have that information ahead of time. Whereas today, what they do is they go and talk to the patient. I'm complaining of back pain this seems a little suspicious, then they will leave and go query cures beyond, um, separate from the patient. The question comes down to what the law says is that the prescriber needs to consult the database. For emergency physicians in the continuity of care, we may have a patient who comes in at one o'clock. They may not be discharged until 10 o'clock. And the physician who initially saw them, who got the cures information and put it into their medical record, may not end up being the physician who actually prescribes. So one, and we've been working with your staff in trying to um, provide some suggested uh, changes to the FAQs that would say that if a physician consults cures, a hard copy of cures, that would satisfy the requirement, meaning that when the physician at 10 o'clock looks at cures, although they were not the person that actually drew it from cures, that that would satisfy the requirement. We recognize that we may be, um, and I just lost Dr. Lewis. He's like, I've had enough of this. <laughs> right. Uh, I feel the same way. Uh, and I won't talk about cosmetic surgery either. Uh, <laughs> But nonetheless, we have reached out to the staff to uh, throw some ideas out there. We recognize this may need some clarifying legislation to be put through, so we're not suggesting that the medical board uh, put something in their FAQ that's outside the bounds of the law. Uh, but nonetheless, we just want to make the um, issue, um, just make a comment on it here in public. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any comments on the phone? No comments at this time. Great. Okay, we are adjourned for today and we will resume tomorrow at 9 a.m.